Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to all of you. My name is Dietrich Domanski. I'm the Secretary General of the Financial Stability Board. Thanks to all of you for joining us today. As you know, following the turmoil in financial markets at the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, the FSB, in collaboration with standard-setting bodies, developed a comprehensive and ambitious work program to enhance resilience in non-bank financial intermediation, or as we call it, NBFI. Since then, the FSB has carried out work and published reports in a number of specific NBFI areas, money market funds, open-ended funds, margining practices, bond market liquidity, and US dollar funding. The main focus of that work has been on assessing and addressing vulnerabilities in those areas that may have contributed to the buildup of liquidity imbalances and their amplification. We are now starting to discuss how the findings of the various NBFI initiatives can be brought together with a view to developing a systemic approach to NBFI. Today's conference is an important input in this process. The conference features presentations of analytical work and research that advances the understanding of how vulnerabilities in specific NBFI areas can lead to systemic risk and how specific policies and approaches may be used to address them. As you have seen from the agenda, we've divided the conference in four sessions. In the first session, chaired by UKFCA Chief Economist Kate Collier, we will discuss liquidity imbalances in bond markets. The second session, chaired by John Fell, Deputy Director General at the ECB, will discuss interconnectedness in NBFI. In the third session, which will take place tomorrow and will be chaired by ESMA Chief Economist Stefan Kern, we will discuss data and tools to enhance the monitoring of risks. And in the last session, chaired by Marina Moretti from the IMF, we will focus on policy tools to address systemic risk in NBFI. In each session, a short presentation by one of the authors of each research paper will be followed by a discussant. Presentations and discussions will focus on the practical implications of the research. After all papers in each session have been presented, we will open the floor for general discussion on how the papers advance our understanding of the topic covered by the session. I would very much invite all of you to actively participate in that discussion. We are looking for an interactive discussion and uh, ask everybody to feel free to contribute their views on the lessons that can be learned from the research presented over the course of the next two days. Um, before we get started, perhaps a couple of logistical points. You can put your hand up uh, to make an intervention by clicking on the hand button on the right hand side of your screen. Please remember to bring your hand down again once you, the floor had been given to you. To ensure good line quality and to be able to see the person who speaks, I would ask you to unmute your line and switch on the video only when you speak. We are recording this event and we plan to publish a record of it on our website. And if you want to ask a question or make a point, you can also use the chat function in, uh, in WebEx. So, um, so much for the housekeeping. Without further ado, let me now give the floor to Kate who is chairing the first session on liquidity imbalances in bond markets. Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and, um, and I would like to start by saying a very warm welcome and thank you to our panelists and discussants for this first session. Uh, my name is Kate Collier and I'm Chief Economist at the Financial Conduct Authority in the UK. I am joined today by an expert group to discuss this very important question of liquidity imbalances in bond markets and the implications for systemic risk. We have three excellent papers and three expert discussants. I will introduce them um, more formally, but um, to, to, to introduce you to the panel quickly, I'm joined by Andreas Shrimp from the Bank, Bank for International Settlements, Christoph Stahl from the Investment Company Institute, Robert Cech from the Bank of England, Evangelos Benos from the University of Nottingham, Simon Jakartis from the Bank of England, and Jessica Lee from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. We will be hearing from each of our presenters and discussants in turn, and then we will open up for discussion. In that discussion, we will be particularly looking to explore some of the practical implications of the research we're about to hear about. Uh, in particular, we want to explore developments in bond markets, 
um, including changes to the investor base and the role of bank and non-bank dealers and what this means for risk. We're also interested in uh, the main drivers of liquidity imbalances in bond markets during stress episodes and the conditions under which such imbalances could result in system-wide stress. After the presentations, I will ask the panel to explore these questions, um, as well as questions um, from the audience. We would very much like to hear from you. Please do um, put your questions in the sidebar, and I will do my best to ask them of the panel when we get into our discussion. So I will hand over now um, to Andreas Shrimp for the first presentation on non-bank financial intermediaries and financial stability. Andreas is the head of financial markets at the Bank for International Settlements and has previously served as the secretary to the Markets Committee. Our discussant for this paper is Christoph Stahl. Christoph is a senior economist at the Investment Company Institute's Research Department, where his work focuses on issues related to the mutual fund industry. So without further ado, Andreas, thank you and over to you. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Kate, uh, for this uh, warm introduction and uh, also to the organizers for putting this uh, paper on the program. <clears throat> I should say that this is joint work with Sirio and Aramonte and Yun Shin, my colleagues at the BAS. So, um, just at the start, um, so let me just state uh, the three objectives that we have in this paper, and that's also guiding the talk that I'm giving today. So. So, first of all, um, what we want to do in this paper is to describe the structural shifts in financial intermediation uh, in the post GFC environment, in particular, accelerated rise in non bank financial intermediation um, with a focus on fixed income markets, but not exclusively. We're generally covering also um, other OTC markets in, in that work. Um, but uh, clearly, uh, fixed income markets are a, a key way through which one can see a lot of the changes that have been happening. Um, and then the second key objective of the paper is to provide a simple conceptual framework uh, to help us understand some of the systemic risk propagation in non-bank financial intermediation. Here, the focus is really on um, the interconnection, the interplay really between liquidity risk uh, and leverage. And what we will be highlighting is uh, channels um, that operate through changes in margins and how that could lead um, to stress propagation and spillover effects. And then last but not least, the key objective is also to, to derive some high level policy implications from the work. And in particular, as they pertain to reducing the occurrence of liquidity demand and supply imbalances in the system. So, um, at the beginning, it's useful to just take a, a high level overview of some of the key changes in the financial system over the over the past decade. So here, what I'm showing is um, some statistics from the flow of funds in the US. Um, on the left hand side, you see um, some key sectors and the total assets, how they evolve over time here shown on the lock scale. And really, we should focus on the blue line here, which is the broker dealer sector in the US, uh, which has typically been the locus of uh, market intermediation. Um, and then we're showing this sector uh, compa in comparison to other key ones, such as commercial banks, uh, non financial corporates and households. Um, you can see really how the t total assets of the broker dealer sector had a, a spectacular rise sort of starting in the mid 70s up to the great financial crisis. Then we had a collapse and, and pretty much then the sector has been rather state stagnant in terms of the, um, the overall evolution of the assets. Um, on the right hand side, we show the total leverage in the broker dealer sector as assets over equity over a shorter time period. You can also see really how much the basically growth in uh, total assets over the of the broker dealer sector, how that was underpinned by a large degree of leverage, uh, with leverage rising up to almost 50 uh, before the GFC, and then then it collapsed subsequently. So if one would take a take this at face value and look at this, one could get the impression that market-based intermediation is is in big retreat. But that's uh, incomplete, so it rather migrated elsewhere. Um, and so here, um, this is just showing us a, um, a simple flow chart um, um, in the financial system with the ultimate savers on the right, the ultimate borrowers in the left, and various players that are, are connecting the two and that are involved in the intermediation. And um, the broker dealer sector really used to be a key part of um, the market intermediary sector. But if we're taking a look at the changes that have occurred uh, after the GFC, 
really see now that it's a whole mosaic of players that are involved in in routing um, the, the the flows between the savers and the borrowers and help in helping basically um, uh, various players to adjust exposures, hedge risks, etc. Um, we have in particular principal trading firms in the fixed income markets, especially on the run treasury securities, but also in um, in futures markets that have become much more important in terms of liquidity provision. Then we have also as part of the institutional investor base hedge funds, uh, relative value funds in particular that um, that have uh, a much greater role to play in liquidity provision. Um, and then the whole asset management sector, bond funds, open ended funds, ETFs, et cetera, that have, have, have grown in, in significance. And then importantly also, uh, I should say, are the uh, financial market infrastructures. Their role has also risen significantly. And here, especially, let me point out the role of CCPs, um, uh, which, which have risen because of a policy driven shift uh, post GFC to make OTC markets uh, more um, robust. Now, um, basically, what this means um, is that uh, liquidity supply is no longer the sole of domain of broker dealers, but it involves a broader sector, bro broader set of players, um, uh, as I mentioned, PTFs and hedge funds. The way how I would, however, characterize also this type of liquidity provision is that it is of a more opportunistic fashion, of a more, a more opportunistic nature compared to that by traditional bank dealers. And then on the other hand, given the vast growth in um, in bond funds, um, et cetera, hedge funds as well. We have also um, 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 the spikes of liquidity demand from the NBFI sector that, that have become much more um, relevant and, and, and much more potent to be disruptive, in particular due to the liquidity mismatches and the leverage that's em employed in some of these um, vehicles. Um, and, and so overall, the, the management of liquidity risk has taken a greater prominence from a financial stability perspective. Now, this slide here tries to make a simple point that um, the liquidity provision that uh, market uh, intermediaries um, uh, perform in the financial system, that that typically rests on leverage. So we're plotting the change in assets in the US broker dealer sector against the change in either the debt or the change in the equity. One can really see that it's really the change in debt that's virtually driving all that balance sheet expansion. And, and that tries to make a simple point that um, um, typically uh, the, the balance sheet underpinning li um, uh, liquidity provision, they're, they're very much dependent on, on leverage uh, that operates through compressions in margins in particular. Um, and so what these key changes to the structure of the financial system means so the overall shift towards more uh, market-based intermediation and, and BFIs is that the traditional way of thinking about uh, systemic risk, which is like uh, it typically the domino model of the cascading defaults, so that gives an incomplete picture. Um, in the new normal where NBFI dominates, it's not necessary that defaults uh, figure in the propagation mechanism. And so what we do in the paper is we offer a simple accounting framework for debt capacity that um, helps us to make the case that uh, there can be systemic uh, risk propagation also in the absence of defaults. And the key starting point here is uh, the role of margins that limit the use of debt financing and fluctuations in margin in, in turn um, really define uh, the debt capacity of the of the different investors in, in the economy. Um, so the, the way it works is that a market participant chooses a portfolio, but taken into account that a margin constraint. So in essence, what the investor needs to do is to do a risk budgeting decision where he takes into account that the margins, basically the uh, capital underpinning the different positions, could, can be short positions, can be long positions, can involve derivatives or cash securities. But that needs to be adding up to the economic capital of the agent. And so this is actually relatively similar to just a very basic consumer choice problem with goods um, uh, over goods with expenditure equal to the margins and then the, the budget being that economic capital. Now, based on that framework, we derive two propositions. The first one is 
that the debt capacity of an investor is recursively defined. Um, and that uh, leads to uh, several implications, in particular that uh, debt capacity is increasing in the debt capacity of others. So we have an amplification mechanism, uh, leverage uh, um, enables greater leverage. And then also conversely, you know, if we're in a situation when one player uh, gets hit and it's, uh, um, it's the debt capacity shrinks, that will also create spillover effects and, and propagate stress, even if we don't have a default of that player. And so this has also several implications, in particular that if we are facing a deleveraging um, due to spike in margin, that can really have some system-wide effects because it reduces the debt capacity in the system, which in turn also, as I showed before, because leverage underpins liquidity provision, it hampers uh, intermediaries' ability to support market liquidity, um, and it can spill over, feeding a, a full-blown spiral. Um, the second proposition is um, that when the margins go up, investors shift uh, their portfolio positions from high margin assets to low margin assets with low margin assets being uh, the ones that, um, for example, just like cash or safe securities have, uh, such as treasuries or T-bills um, have very low uh, margins. Um, so there is essentially um, um, a du duality in a, in a way between the, the leveraging and the dash for cash. So these two are the side, uh, two sides of the same coin uh, rather than two distinct channels of systemic risk propagation. And so this work has several um, implications for um, when it comes to the structural changes for liquidity. As I mentioned before, um, uh, risk is, is less uh, warehoused inside of the banking system, but uh, much more in the NBFI space. So this means uh, greater vehemence of liquidity demand spikes. At the same time, the provision of liquidity in fixed income and other OTC markets is more opportunistic and fragile. And um, while credit risk per se has been reduced due to the post GFC reforms, um, liquidity crisis per se are, are, um, have become actually more likely. Um, and let me now turn to the set of policies that um, that basically um, um, policy implications that our work has. So essentially it means that um, it, is, it is useful to engage in ex-ante policies that precisely reduce the ins incidence of liquidity demand spikes that originate from the NBFI sector. And um, uh, these could be because of the inherent liquidity mismatches or leverage that is in, um, that the business models of these players entail. And um, that requires uh, engaging in uh, adequate levels of self-insurance, making sure that um, uh, corresponding buffers are in place and the risks are appropriately managed. The second um, and very key one related to our framework is that it is very useful to think about ways to address the excess procyclicality in margins. Um, in particular because of the important system-wide effects on debt capacity and liquidity that are highlighted. And then third, and that relates more to the uh, supply of liquidity, um, so it's that it's important to have flexible nodes so that liquidity supply can come in and can be mobilized at times of stress. And for that, well-capitalized banks are a precondition, but then also the buffers um, that these banks have need to be usable at times of stress so that liquidity supply can really come in. And, uh, and, and furthermore, uh, it's also important to think about the market infrastructures that they're well functioning and, um, and other market reforms. And I, I hope we can cover them in the discussion later on. Let me stop here. Excellent, thank you, Andreas. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Christoph, um, who is our discussant for this paper. Christoph, we can't hear you. I don't know whether you may be on mute. Thank you. I think somebody unmuted me because I couldn't find that one button in that shrink screen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon. Good evening, everybody. 
I wanted to uh, thank uh, the organizers for having me to discuss the paper uh, uh, from Armante Schrimpf and Shin. Uh, I wanted to real quick give my disclaimer. I haven't heard that from uh, Andreas yet, uh, but you know the views expressed herein are those of uh, myself and do not reflect the Investment Company Institute, its staff, or its member firms. Uh, so I have a relatively short uh, time uh, given to me. Interesting paper. I wanted to real quick summarize it, and I think Andreas had given a very nice uh, summary of it. Uh, there's an extensive discussion. It's really three parts. There's an extensive discussion of that MBFI landscape and the concerns that emanate uh, potentially about systemic risk from that. And the key points are liquidity transformation and leverage uh, that Andreas has nicely uh, pointed out. Then uh, the developing an accounting framework for system-wide risk capacity uh, for really market participants that are deploying leverage. So in some form that uh, the model or the, the framework reminded me of uh, uh, yeah, Greenwood uh, and his colleagues in uh, uh, JFE 2015, uh, Duarte Eisenbach in the JF 2021 has been around for a long time, and ultimately also uh, Nicola Cettorelli from the, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, who have had on their Liberty Street blog something similar. I'm not endorsing any of those models, but that it reminded me a little bit of it. And I think as Andreas indicated, there's this inherent multiplier effect in the model and that reminded me in some form of a, of a money multiplier, you can think about that, that is generating additional debt capacity in the system uh, from increasing individual debt, debt capacity. And then uh, the other one is the shocks to margin lead to deleveraging. And as, as Andreas pointed out, it's not uniform across assets, but higher margin assets garner a stronger reaction to that. And then ultimately, uh, they're, they're finishing with a policy discussion. I think they're, uh, it's a, you know, they're making the point correctly that should be a holistic approach. Uh, there's a concern about moral hazard. So the question is, how do you self-discipline market participants? What I kind of was missing a little bit is the discussion about cost-benefit analysis and then only tend to consequences. And uh, you know, kind of a push towards a uh, a general equilibrium uh, framework. Uh, so let me see if I can advance. That. There you go. So I wanted to pick up three points from his broader discussion. Uh, and one is about do bond funds engage in fire sales, uh, the redemption issue, uh, and then about the strategic complementarity that is kind of central in in some of their paper. Uh, so the first question is, you know, do uh, funds uh, engage in fire sales. And so from page 13, uh, they argue that funds need to meet large redemption, hence might engage in fire sales. So in some form, the fire sale aspect is coming from the Koval Stafford, uh, you know, quite data paper now, the JFE 2007 paper. I wanted to remind everybody that under the SEC rule, there's a liquidity risk management program in place and funds must actually invest uh, 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 quite uh, a substantial amount in highly liquid assets uh, to meet potential future uh, liquidity demands coming from redemption. And I think it's worthwhile pointing out what that actually looks like. Uh, ICI had done a survey uh, in around the 2020 uh, event, and you see on the left-hand side down here are the holdings of core bond mutual funds. I think this is one of the, the main topics that we're talking about. Core uh, bond mutual funds, they hold, of course, uh, investment grade uh, uh, corporate bonds, uh, but then they also hold quite a bit of treasuries, and you can think about this, this is this highly liquid investment. But what actually happened during March uh, in, in uh, 2020 is they mostly use treasuries to meet redemptions, but also, and this is something to uh, consider, they also use treasuries to potentially be in a position uh, to purchase some of those undervalued corporate bonds that might have been sold by others. So. In terms of selling, on the right hand side, I have really a daily sales volume investment grade corporate bonds relative to the total volume that you have seen. And the corporate bonds uh, really make a kind of a small fraction. You see there's a little bit of, of an increase here around 312, 313, but it's really a small fraction. And so kind of that points maybe to the result from uh, J1 Choi and his co-authors in their JFE 19 paper that says there's actually not that impact that Koval Stafford measured. Uh, next point to consider is uh, strategic complementarity in funds. Uh, on their page 15, they argue that strategic uh, fund level complementarity are stronger when underlying assets are 
more liquid. And so this is really the the argument that had come from from uh, Goldstein and his colleagues in their 2010 and 2017 JFE paper. <clears throat> what I argue in a more recent paper in 2020, 2021 is that this might be a phenomenon <clears throat> at the market level. So in some form, nobody wants to hold a hot potato, meaning an illiquid asset <clears throat> when the market starts to fall. And so everybody's selling. <clears throat> so I've down here, I've superimposed uh, the baseline results. And I do a more formal test in the paper between uh, ETA's work and result and, and the work that I'm using that are direct investors, so they're directly holding the assets, <clears throat> not, through, not through a mutual fund. <clears throat> Coffee always helps. And you see the responses are very similar between the two classes. <clears throat> that raises the point whether the Strategic complementarity is coming from the asset market level or the fund level, then I argue it's coming from the asset market level. <clears throat> Another point is that they're making on page 17, ETFs are potentially concerned when they're selling through APs their underlying assets. And I kind of started to look at that uh, some time ago, how much they're actually selling. On the left hand side, you have the outflows on a weekly basis out of ETFs. These are fixed income ETFs in the US. On the right hand side, I drill all the way down into the actual uh, basket composition, what is being handed over to APs, and then look at the actual trading volume in the underlying market, meaning in trace, using trace in the US. And for a large amount, you find actually there is very little demand that is significant uh, beyond what you would expect normally uh, coming from those in kind ETFs. I think that's a that's an important question to consider when one considers <clears throat> policy implications of whether ETFs are actually posing a systemic risk. Uh, so let me talk real quick about the 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 paper. Uh, there's like really I want to make two technical points in the little time that I have, uh, and then we get some more time maybe later on in discussion. But one is about this comparative static result where you are his second uh, uh, conjecture that he has about that if margins increases, uh, there's a shift towards uh, lower margin assets. And so I'm not quite sure this is uh, ultimately correct. Again, my math skills have been deteriorated a little bit of time, but on their page <clears throat> authority, they have kind of this equation that you see here where they can then argue that this is actually the case. Uh, I think, at least based on my understanding of, of uh, subadditivity, that doesn't quite hold correctly. And so in some form, so this is the rest of it. I don't think because of this taking absolute values uh, somewhere uh, along the line uh, where we don't know what the individual terms are, whether they're positive or negative. And I think that's kind of where, uh, from my perspective, you get a little bit of a concern that maybe the math is is not quite up to that. At least I cannot conclude what they're concluding that uh, they are uh, moving towards lower margin assets. <clears throat> and then the last point I wanted to make real quick is about something that they had discussed too, that one should move more towards general equilibrium models, you know, understanding this is very difficult because this is now a large economy effectively. But what they're arguing somewhere is that you have uh, this increase or decrease in leverage that is quite substantial uh, in, in their model. And I think that hinges on some sort of assumptions that they're making about expected returns. And I think what I, when I go through something uh, about expected returns, and I kind of imply a multi-factor, two-factor model, one factor is the market, the other one is some liquidity factor. I don't quite get to where they are in the limit case when they argue that assets start to become highly correlated or fully correlated. And so what I get there is that actually the, you, uh, the expected returns also shrink towards one another. And then that, you know, the, the conclusion that they're drawing is, is looking very different. So I think that is making the point about uh, what they're saying the authors, a more general equilibrium uh, type of approach would be really helpful in understanding uh, really uh, in detail what's going on. All right, so I'll leave it at that and I hope I then can uh, mute myself again, but I think I maybe just stop sharing and then this will all be fine. There you go. All right, thank you. Christoph, thank you very much. Um, thank you also to Andreas.
Um, I'm going to move us straight on then to our second paper, which is on the unintended consequences of holding dollar assets. And for this, our presenter is Robert Check, who is a senior research economist at the Bank of England, uh, where his research is mainly focused on structure and interconnectedness of fixed income and derivative markets. Um, and our discussant for this paper is Evangelos Benos. Evangelos is a professor of finance at the Nottingham University Business School, and his work spans a range of topics related to market structure. Uh, and if I could encourage our presenters and discussants to, um, to allow us plenty of time for discussion at the end, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Kate, for the nice introduction. I hope you can all hear me well and see my slides. Perfect. Um, yeah, I would also like to thank the organizers for including our paper on the program. And um, I should mention that uh, the views that uh, are expressed in the presentation are only our own and not uh, necessarily those of the Bank of England or its committees. So the title of the paper is Unintended Consequences of Holding Dollar Assets. And this is joint work with uh, Xiang Huang from Hong Kong University, uh, Dong Lu from the LSE, and uh, Tianyu Wang from uh, Tsinghua. So what was the motivation for, um, for this paper? So typically we view government bonds as the safest and most liquid financial assets. And typically what we observed in, in many uh, stress periods before was that uh, there's a large buying demand for these assets. And uh, this has been uh, dubbed the uh, flight to safety or a uh, flight to quality. However, what we observed in March 2020 was that there was a unprecedented global sell off of um, government bonds um, around the globe. And this has been called the dash for cash. And in the UK guild market, um, we also saw a very pronounced yield spike of more than 50 basis points. And uh, this happened only in seven trading days between March 10 and 18. And what we observed by looking at the micro data is that this was accompanied by the heavy selling of three investor groups. So the first one was the um, debt management office of the UK who had uh, pre-scheduled auctions and were selling around 4 billion of gilts at that time. Uh, the second one was uh, mutual funds who were facing large redemptions and then uh, sold their um, government bond holdings uh, to meet these redemptions. And then third, and most surprisingly, we saw that insurers and pension funds were large sellers of uh, uh, government bonds at the time. And this came as quite a surprise because we typically view uh, these investors as typical long-term buy and hold investors. So we were really intrigued to find out what was driving uh, the selling of ICTS, as we call them. So here is pretty much our paper in, an, in a nutshell. So what you can see here in the dashed red line is the 10-year government bond yield, so the 10-year guilt yield. And as I said before, in only seven trading days between March 10 and March 19, um, we saw a, a yield spike of more than 50 basis points. And only um, due to the BOE announcement on March 19, we saw uh, that yields then started decreasing and uh, returning back to what we think are our normal levels. Um, and at the time, and this is the black line here, we also saw a sharp appreciation of the US dollar against the pound. Um, so the US dollar appreciated more than 10% at the time. So this motivated us to look um, at the holdings of uh, US dollars by um, UK insurers and pension funds. And we also have um, looked at their FX hedging positions. Um, so they typically sell US dollars forward um, to hedge their uh, dollar asset holdings. So this is um, quite different from studies that we've seen, for instance, for the US Treasury markets, um, where there's been a strong focus on the role of dealer banks. So the two famous papers by Duffy and Tay and others. And also, um, yeah, the flow induced sales by mutual funds. So my co author, uh, uh, has a paper on that and also among uh, others document that. Um, and in our empirical setting, we have actually two main advantages. So the first one is that we have extremely granular investor level data on asset and derivative holdings for the insurance sector. Uh, we also have very granular uh, transaction data on uh, bond and repo transactions. And we also have data on estimated variation margin demands across different sectors. So we have that for hedge funds, for asset managers, and for insurers and pension funds. 
And due to these granular data, we are able to offer important insights for government bond markets in virtually all non-US countries. And what we reveal is, uh, hopefully I can convince you of that, is a novel mechanism through which the reserve currency status of the dollar can have a large impact on non-US safe asset yields through a currency hedging term. Um, let me briefly introduce the data sources that we use. So we use supervisory data on asset and derivative holdings of UK insurers. Um, so this is the Solvency 2 data, and we obtain that on a, on a quarterly basis. Uh, the second data that we use is the transaction level data on uh, guilt trades from the MIFID 2 database. And importantly, we observe the uh, counterparties. Um, so that's a big advantage compared, for instance, to uh, trades in the US where uh, it's uh, impossible to observe the uh, counterparties. The third data that we use is also uh, transaction data on the repo trades from the Sterling Money Market database. And that also includes counterparty identifiers. And as I mentioned before, we have the estimated variation margin codes um, that are based on derivatives data from the uh, EMEA trade repository data. And this is based on a methodology of my colleague, uh, our colleagues, Badasha and others in, in their paper 2021. So let me briefly introduce um, the asset holdings of UK insurers. So uh, given, or unsurprisingly, uh, most of their assets are uh, denominated in uh, pound sterling, so roughly 70 to 80%, depending on uh, the period. But then the next largest chunk is, is US dollars. Um, so around 12, 13% of their holdings are denominated in US dollars, which is, of course, unsurprising, um, given that uh, more than half of the world's assets are uh, denominated in dollars. Um, so in total, this amounts to roughly uh, 250 billion um, that UK insurers invest in, in dollar assets. And of course, they are prudent and uh, uh, hedge, these, uh, hedge these exposures by selling um, dollars forward through FX derivatives. So via FX forwards, FX swaps, and cross-currency swaps. And here you can observe the uh, UK insurance derivatives holdings. So um, the largest share of the derivatives are actually interest rate swaps. So more than half um, of, of their derivative holdings are IRS. Um, then the next largest chunk, uh, so 20, 30% are actually FX derivatives. And um, then the next big, big group are inflation swaps and others. And what we observe in the data is that insurers typically hatch around 50% of their US dollar exposure, so 50 cents for every dollar that they hold. And this is uh, significantly more than for other currencies. So for other currencies, they only hatch roughly 20%. Next, we are looking at the variation margin demand. So as I mentioned before, uh, dollar appreciated more than 10% against sterling. Um, so this is the, the black line in the left, in the left figure. And given that uh, UK insurers and pension funds are selling uh, dollars forward um, uh, to, to hedge their um, asset positions, this meant that the sector faced very large variation margin falls um, of more than 6 billion on their uh, FX derivatives alone in, in seven trading days between March 10 and 18. And what you also see in the right figure, um, so the total amount of uh, variation margin demands uh, amounted to roughly 12 billion. So they also, uh, receive uh, uh, had to pay large variation margin uh, calls on uh, their interest rate swaps and also their inflation swaps. So for them, it was really a perfect storm where all the derivative positions kind of moved against them. And as you can see in the cross-sectional uh, comparison, um, the variation margin demands really exceeded those of uh, mutual funds and hedge funds, who at the time faced relatively small uh, margins. And interestingly, when we look at the, the cross-section of insurers, um, we find that um, it's not necessarily that every insurer was affected by that. Um, what we find is really that those insurers, so the top half of, um, of uh, USD hedgers, um, so this is the red line here, um, this, this group of investors was really heavily affected, whereas those who hedge not at all or hedge very little um, have been barely affected by these variation margin calls. And next, we are looking at the uh, subsequent uh, trading in guilds by different investor groups. So obviously, in order to meet these variation margin calls, insurers had multiple options. So they could uh, stop investing their incoming uh, premia. They could use their cash holdings. They could uh, repo out their, their guilds. Um, so they had multiple options. But what we actually observe in the data is that um, once these um, other potential sources of liquidity um, so they also sold a lot of MMF shares and uh, 
uh, also um, redeemed um, their revolving credit lines. But once these uh, very liquid uh, assets have been uh, had been depleted, they started selling off gills and um, into and on aggregate they sold almost four billion of gills at the time. On the other side, uh, we also observed that uh, especially dealer banks and hedge funds um, tried to or yeah made a, made a killing pretty much and uh, bought the the gills at a discount at the time. So in order to um, have a statistical um, analysis of this, we really look at a very granular investor day uh, level uh, regressions. So what we find is that um, the effect of the selling in response to uh, variation margin calls is most pronounced for uh, VM calls on FX derivatives. So insurers sell almost uh, 41 cents of gilts for every dollar of uh, VM call that they have to pay. They follow a liquidity packing order and sell their relatively liquid gilts first. What we also find is that there's an asymmetric effect. So they sell gilts when uh, they have to pay variation margin, but they don't buy when they receive variation margin. What we also find when looking at the uh, repo data is that they also started to uh, increase their repo borrowing by around 2 billion during the dash for cash. And this was again driven by the variation margin calls on FX derivatives. And we also know from market intelligence that the guild repo market was highly liquid at the time and also was very costly to, to borrow. Otherwise, we uh, assume that we would have seen uh, yeah, a larger share in, in repo borrowing by uh, ICPS. Um, and then in the final set of our regressions, we also look whether the selling pressure by SCPFs um, had a price impact. And what we find is that uh, they contributed significantly to the yield spike in the guild market. So one standard deviation increase in the ICPF selling leads to a 30 bips increase in guild yields during the dash for cash. So that's nearly 60% of the, of the total yield spike. And what we find is the effect is also much more pronounced for longer term guilds. So those with a maturity of five years or, or longer. Then just to conclude, um, when we look at, at uh, the data from, from other countries, or uh, of course we don't have the, the kind of granular data that we have, but um, we observe very similar, similar effects. So we see typically a um, depreciation of the domestic currency against the dollar during the, the dash for cash or these seven, seven trading days in, in March 2020. And this is accompanied by a spike in the domestic 10-year uh, government bond yield, so the red dash line here. So I plotted this here for six different countries in a vast economy, so Australia, Canada, Switzerland, New Zealand, and Germany, and Japan. Um, and in all of these countries, we observe uh, a similar effect. So I would definitely encourage other regulators to, uh, who have this, this, this kind of data to look whether um, this effect has also happened in, in their country. So we know from uh, other studies for uh, Norway and Denmark that uh, this, this um, has, been, has been a feature in their, their markets as well. But uh, of course, it would be um, interesting to see more evidence on this as well. So just to conclude, um, we reveal a novel mechanism through which the uh, reserve currency status of the dollar can have a large impact on non-US safe asset yields through this currency hedging uh, channel. So given the prominence of uh, US dollar assets, um, a lot of investors um, diversify their portfolios and then hedge these exposures by um, selling US forward uh, through FX derivatives. But then in crisis periods, we typically observe that the dollar appreciates and this leads to large margin calls on these FX hedging positions. And then institutions sell their domestic safe assets to, to meet these margin calls and thereby contribute to yield spikes and potentially exacerbate crises in domestic markets. And I would also highlight the important policy implications. So we believe that it's necessary to enhance the liquidity preparedness of insurers and pension funds, for instance, via an increase in their required holdings of liquid assets. And second, we also believe that uh, it would be helpful to make margin calls more predictable, for instance, through more transparent margin calculations. And hopefully such measures may prevent similar liquidity drains in future downturns. So without further ado, um, yeah, I look forward to uh, Evangelos' discussion and uh, discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. Uh, and uh, I'll hand over to Evangelos. Uh, can you see my screen? Can you see my screen? We can see it, yes. Okay, very good. 
Well, thank you very much uh, um, for, you know, to the organizers and, you know, for inviting me to discuss this paper. Uh, thanks to Kate for uh, this uh, uh, beautiful introduction. Uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to go over some of the key points, but then I would, I would like to share some thoughts uh, with all of you about the wider policy implications uh, of this paper. So the narrative here is uh, one about uh, investments in uh, dollar denominated assets and uh, how these investments ultimately can uh, induce price pressure. Uh, so what happens is you have uh, foreign ownership of dollar assets and these dollar assets are hedged via uh, derivatives, uh, for example, FX swaps. And uh, the authors uh, you know, demonstrate that uh, they saw that in their data that uh, every, every unit of uh, dollar assets held, uh, you have insurers, for example, that heads at least half of that. And then you got a sequence of events uh, taking place. Uh, for example, in the period that's uh, being analyzed here, uh, you had market volatility, uh, which uh, caused the USD, the dollar, to appreciate uh, versus various currencies, not just uh, the pound sterling, but as uh, as Robert showed, uh, versus other currencies as well. So in this chart here, this is depicted by the black solid line. And what happens then is that the um, variation margins uh, of these uh, swaps basically uh, go up, uh, and especially for those entities who have hedged uh, dollar exposures, uh, these uh, price movements in the exchange rate is, is going to mean that they're going to be out of the money, so they're going to be the ones paying uh, variation margin. Uh, and that was the case, for example, in the data that was uh, you know, in the paper uh, for UK insurers. Uh, but then, of course, the, this these payments have to be covered somehow, and uh, that's going to involve necessarily, or at least as uh, uh, Robert discussed, the liquidation of some non-USD financial assets, yields in this particular case. And thus, you have price pressure, you have flow, and this results in price pressure, which is the red dotted line in this in this chart, which, as Robert said, summarizes essentially the key findings of the paper. And this price pressure is quite substantial. So what I would like to do now is, is to kind of take a step back a little bit and uh, think and share some thoughts, as I said, with, about the wider policy implications. So there are two things here, uh, in my view, two key ingredients of these effects. First of all, you have the flow, right? You have, the, you have uh, market participants essentially uh, selling uh, non-USD safe assets, and that's creating selling pressure. But, you know, selling pressure on its own might not necessarily, or in theory, should not necessarily be uh, a sufficient condition uh, for, uh, for prices to move uh, because you might have contraside liquidity. So there's another second ingredient here that you essentially need, which is you must have some degree of constraints uh, amongst uh, liquidity providers, dealers in this particular case. Right, so you have these two ingredients, so as to speak, and these two ingredients collectively produce, I think, the results that uh, Robert discussed. So what I want to do for the next, uh, you know, in the next three or four slides is to share a little bit uh, some thoughts about the wider context, because, you know, this num the second point, the, the, the constraint on balance sheets is, I think, something that ultimately policymakers are going to have to deal with. And this was very nicely summarized in a recent speech by Andrew Hauser of the Bank of England. Uh, and it's captured in these charts that you see on the right hand side there, where you see that the, the dealers and major financial intermediaries balance sheets essentially have stagnated with respect to overall uh, outstanding amounts in government bonds in, in these charts. But this is also true in other uh, fixed income securities. Uh, corporate bonds would uh, also be uh, a case in point there, uh, you know, given that issuance in, the, in corporate bonds has skyrocketed uh, over, the, over the recent past. So you have this fundamental problem. The problem is that you have an increasing amount of outstanding securities, fixed income securities, has to be intermediated by a finite and uh, essentially non-increasing uh, amount of, in, uh, you know, non-increasing inside balance sheets. That's essentially, I think, as I see it, uh, you know, the key issue. And of course, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, central banks stepping in, as they did uh, during the COVID pandemic. And you can see here in this chart that all, you know, the, the BOE, the ECB and the Fed all stepped in and acquired very large and sizable amounts of, uh, of securities uh, in order to help uh, 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 ease uh, market conditions. And there is talk as a result of uh, central banks becoming market makers of last resort. 
However, one thought about this is that this problem here, as depicted in this chart, seems to be a little bit more permanent, seems to be a bit structural. And then the question is whether central banks are going to be willing to play this role on a more consistent and ongoing basis, right? Uh, and, um, you know, they're supposed to be last resort uh, measures, but if the problem is structural, then maybe uh, regulators uh, should think about a more permanent uh, solution. Uh, central banks definitely don't want to be uh, intervening in, in these markets for the purpose of market making on a consistent and ongoing basis. That would not necessarily be a last resort uh, action. Uh, so then there's discussion about centralized clearing, expanding centralized clearing in uh, a lot of these uh, securities markets. And I think that's a great idea uh, because the big thing about centralized clearing is it facilitates multilateral netting, right? And multilateral netting allows exposures to be reduced. And if you're a dealer with uh, balanced exposures, uh, then that means that's going to save and uh, some balance sheet capacity, which can be used for intermediation purposes. So currently, this graphic here on the right-hand side is from a paper by Daryl Duffy, and it shows that uh, centralized clearing happens in U.S. Treasuries to a large extent uh, amongst uh, in trades between dealers, but it could it could possibly be expanded in the dealer in the dealer to client uh, segment of the market, and that could. Uh, as I said, free up some balance sheet capacity amongst dealers. There's one caveat about this, however. If you're at a period of stress and where dealers are faced with sell flow, as was the case in the paper that was presented by Robert, uh, the potential benefits of multilateral netting are likely to go down, right? Because dealers uh, are going to are going to basically be be facing uh, sell flow, right? So they'll have to accumulate these safe assets. So, so there's going to be less uh, scope for multilateral netting. So this effect, this otherwise beneficial effect might be less helpful at times of a severe order flow imbalances. So another, so, so, so and the last, this is, this is essentially, I have two or three more slides. Uh, uh, the last, uh, you know, uh, another potential remedy, which I think, may, you know, has not received as much attention is potentially to centralize bond trading, right? Essentially uh, move, uh, to some extent, bond trading into all to all platforms whereby everyone will be able to deal with everyone and that trades will not necessarily uh, be intermediated by exclusively by either dealers or principal trading firms. So uh, the potential benefit of that is that it, it would weaken the dependency of bond markets on just the balances of a few institutions, right? Uh, and um, you would allow essentially whatever other private balance sheet capacity exists in the marketplace uh, to come in and play a role if, if they are willing and if they are capable of doing so. Uh, there are other potential benefits as well. It, you know, there's this well-discussed and established uh, uh, vicious cycle between funding and market liquidity that uh, essentially manifested itself during the financial crisis. This could potentially be weakened. Uh, execution costs might go down if you have... Uh, a wider participation in these markets, chances are that the markets are going to become more competitive. And, uh, you know, uh, currently, you know, retail investors in particular in these markets uh, suffer from high execution costs. So that could, uh, you know, it could help in this respect. And this could be done in several ways. You know, uh, there are currently uh, such uh, all to all platforms uh, uh, where trading takes place in government securities in the inter dealer segment in several jurisdictions. I've listed here some uh, some of these platforms. So one of the things that uh, regulators could do would be to uh, encourage wider participation in these platforms, or uh, or adopt some suggestions that have been made in the context of corporate and municipal bonds, which is to uh, put in place an order display requirement along with some uh, no trade through rules to kind of uh, facilitate a higher a higher degree of uh, of transparency and all to all trading. Uh, there is definitely some interest by market participants out there, uh, non-dealers and non-banks, to participate in these platforms. And it appears as if some of these attempts by such market participants to join these platforms have been resisted, as you can see in this uh, headline from the Financial Times. And there's also some very promising evidence about uh, how these platforms might potentially work. Um, uh, one such case is Israel, where, and it's kind of a very unique case because the vast majority of corporate and government bonds in that country are traded on a limit order book, just like equities, uh, you know, an order book operated by the Tel Aviv stock exchange. And there has been a recent study by Kutai et al, who, who basically studied what happened during the COVID pandemic, like the exact same period that Robert's study is covering, 
uh, with uh, Israeli government bonds, which also faced and experienced sell flow the same way, uh, you know, UK guilds experienced sell flow and US treasuries did. And the interesting thing is that the uh, price impact was a lot smaller. And not only that, but uh, additionally, the bid ask spreads, and you can see this, uh, this, this, this comparison on the right hand side there, the bid ask spreads of uh, Israeli bonds remained subdued, remained very low and didn't change uh, as a result of this sell pressure. And the same was true about the depth of the order book. Uh, so this is again, you know, to summarize, this is uh, this is an option that I think I believe, you know, should be studied a lot more closer, uh, centralizing bond trading and encouraging the centralization of bond trades, which might potentially uh, go some way toward resolving this this kind of structural issue that uh, that we seem to be, uh, you know, dealing with, which is that intermediation capacity is being limited in the face of this increasing, uh, you know, issuance. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this, uh, this paper and its policy implications. I'm going to hand over back to Kate now. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, both Robert and Evangelist. That's, um, that was great. We're going to move on then to our third paper, which is on the understanding um, uh, of the role of dealer-client relationships in bond trading. I think a, a, a nice segue on from our previous discussion. Our presenter for this is Simon Jakartis. Simon is a research economist at the Bank of England, where his research focuses on topics in market microstructure, often relating to liquidity and fixed income markets. And our discussant is Jessica Lee. Jessica is a finance PhD student at the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, where her research interests lie broadly at the intersection of asset pricing and corporate finance, and with a focus on intermediation, corporate debt, and implications um, for financial for financial frictions. Um, we are running, as ever, quite tightly with time. So if I could ask um, uh, Simon and, uh, and, and Jessica, to be mindful of, uh, of our wider discussion for the panel as well. That would be great. Thank you. Um, Simon, over to you. Thank you very much, Kate. I hope you can hear me. Yes, you can. I hope you can see them as well now. Uh, Yes, so Kate, okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction uh, and thanks to the organizers for putting the paper on the program. And actually also thanks to uh, Evangelos for your discussion because you perfectly set the scene for what we are going to talk about, um, which is here understanding the role of um, dealer-client relationships in um, bond trading. And this very much relates to um, also the market structure, the design of this of this market, um, OTC trading with exchange trading, all these things that uh, that Evangelos you've just uh, touched upon. Uh, this is a joint project with Andreas Schrumpf and Karim Fiel-Todorov from the PIS and Niklas Wars, colleague from the Bank of England. So why do we think that it is important uh, to understand the role of relationships between dealers and clients uh, in the corporate bond market? Well, uh, I mean, this is, I guess, what we gathered here uh, together today. Uh, we've seen significant structural changes um, since the global financial crisis in this market that made it more vulnerable to liquidity imbalances. Um, we have seen, on the one side, the growth in uh, investment funds, such as open-ended funds that offer daily liquidity to uh, their investors, and that in turn gives them rise to um, a potential for sudden surges in demand for liquidity. Um, that was already also something that uh, Rob was talking about. Um, and then, even though it wasn't the main focus of the paper. Um, and then on the other hand, um, there's a lot of evidence suggesting that dealers are more constrained now in terms of their intermediation capacities, which reduces the supply of liquidity. And now, Given the OTC structure of the corporate bond market, there's a, a potential role for relationships and how then dealers de decide uh, to uh, how to supply that liquidity across um, clients. And we are asking here whether uh, the decision on, on which terms you're going to provide liquidity to investors will depend on the relationship that dealers have with their clients. Um, and then we are next going to uh, uh, to ask, or uh, we want to understand um, why would dealers uh, care about relationships that 
uh, may not be um, immediately obvious given the um, given the market power of, of theaters in this in this market. Um, and then we want to know whether uh, the, uh, the, the the role of relationship is particularly pronounced in in stress times when clients maybe uh, care most about the um, possibility of obtaining liquidity. Um, to give you a teaser of what we find, um, given the short time that, that we have here today, uh, we find that there's a significant and large role for relationship in this market. Uh, relationship clients pay two thirds lower transaction costs compared to a median uh, client. And in terms of the why dealers would care about this, we find that this is consistent with um, profit maximization and uh, liquidity motives. More on that uh, later. And in terms of when it matters most is that uh, when we look at the dash for cash period, that was also covered by, by Rob, we find that the relationship benefit increases threefold. Um, and we find that it's actually exclusively given or almost exclusively given to um, those clients that dealers used in the past as a source of liquidity. Uh, and uh, that it is given in trades that uh, actually lead to an expansion of the dealer's balance sheet. So exactly those uh, trades where the client um, that the client uses to obtain uh, liquidity. Uh, the data that we use here is uh, um, really sort of optimal um, to to answer the questions that we've set out here to uh, uh, to answer, um, and really improves upon previous data sources. Uh, we use the MIFID two um, transaction data, um, the same one that, that Rob used only here on the corporate uh, bond sector. And let me stress again that really uh, the improvement of this data set compared to the maybe most popular data source, which is Trace, is that uh, we have an identifier for both counterparties in a trade. So um, we, we have an identifier for the client, and that is via the legal entity identifier. And then uh, another big advantage of, of the data that we use here is we combine this with proprietary um, pricing data that we obtained from market access. And uh, this pricing data is basically the, uh, the, the, the pre-trade reference bid ask quotes that um, the clients of market access pay good money for uh, uh, to get an indicator of the, of the fair value of the, uh, of, of the asset at the point of time where they would want to trade uh, that asset. And What's also important for us here is that we observe this, um, uh, these, these prices much more frequently than um, inter-dealer prices, which would used to be used in order to compute the transaction costs um, of clients. Um, and yes, so transaction costs, that is one of the, the, the central variables that, that we have here in, uh, in our analysis. So how do we, um, um, how do we measure um, the role or the, the benefit of, of relationships um, of clients. So while we want to know whether the strength of a relationship between the dealer and the client is associated with the transaction costs that these clients receive from the dealers. And transaction costs are measured here basically by the distance of the transaction price, so the price that they pay to the dealer from the fair um, price in that market. Um, and the, the, the strength of the relationship, we measure basically by uh, the, uh, the, the share of the pound uh, trading volume um, that the dealer exchanges with a particular uh, client across the whole market um, uh, relative to all other clients that the dealer uh, traded with over the past uh, 180 days at the time of the, uh, of the trade. And then uh, we control for uh, different trade characteristics that might influence transaction costs, such as the trade size, whether the client uh, is selling or buying um, uh, a dummy for whether the trade is actually a sort of riskless principal trade where the dealer doesn't actually take any risk uh, or whether the trade um, is executed on a, on a platform. And then we have a rich set of fixed effects that help us to control for a lot of uh, bond dealer and client uh, characteristics by including bond months, dealer months, client months, and industry day uh, fixed effects. So uh, coming to our findings, again, we find that relationships play a very significant role uh, in this 
market. Um, we find that uh, top clients pay five percent, uh, five basis points less than uh, the median client, and this is sixty-seven percent uh, less relative to the average transaction costs in uh, in normal times. Um, and um, also note, uh, as, as a side note, um, we find that uh, in terms of who are those those relationship clients, who are the, the, the top clients, uh, they are over proportionately uh, asset managers and uh, and brokers, and then followed by uh, pension fund and insurance companies. Um, we then set out to test uh, different uh, hypotheses that might explain why relationships uh, matter for, for for a dealer and when they matter most. Uh, first, we want to know whether um, they are consistent with a sort of proximate, profit maximizing uh, motive, which just means that um, uh, similar to, say, to, to, to uh, high street firms to keep their loyal customers offering them uh, discount cards uh, in, in this market then here, uh, because uh, you receive a lot of order flow from a client, you still make a lot of profit from them on every single trade, but you offer them a discount to basically keep them as loyal customers and keep that profit coming. Uh, and we find that indeed uh, that is the case. Another motive might be that dealers try to extract uh, information from specific relationship clients and uh, um, especially those that they deem to be particularly informed about um, uh, the market. Uh, so by offering them discount, keeping the order flow coming to you, uh, you will learn, uh, you, you will get, you will extract information from that order flow and that might help you uh, uh, forward looking to, to steer your, your inventory or make particularly profitable trades. Uh, but we don't find evidence for that. Um, then another motive might be uh, to uh, give discounts to clients that the dealer itself uses regularly as a source of liquidity. Um, and uh, we find indeed evidence uh, for that. And that discounts matter more for trades in which dealer actually uses its own balance sheet to intermediate uh, in the market. And indeed, again, we find evidence uh, for that. Um, quickly on the uh, profit maximizing hypothesis, we find that on average, uh, profits per top client are uh, more than 20 times larger than profits per non-top client, uh, which is sort of over proportional to the amount of trading volume uh, that they get from them. Uh, so that would be consistent with the uh, profit maximizing motif. Um, on the liquidity uh, hypothesis, uh, we find that relationship discounts almost double for clients that um, dealers used as a source of liquidity, uh, which we have identified by looking at the set of clients that dealers frequently approach um, after they have bought from another client on the same day to then offload that bond. In terms of um, uh, trades in which dealers use their own balance sheet, we find that the discount given in those trades is almost twice as large um, compared to trades in which the dealer just um, intermediates between two clients uh, or, or client and another dealer actually uh, in a riskless manner, but just directly offsetting uh, the trade. And we find that the discount given in those trades where the dealer uh, uses its own balance sheets, um, that the discount is twice as large, more than twice as large. Uh, interestingly, for the non-stress uh, uh, episode that we are looking at here, uh, this is largely driven by uh, the trades where the dealer sells out of their inventory rather than trades that the dealer, uh, where the dealer takes the bond into inventory. Then, looking at the uh, uh, dash for cash period from the 1st to 18th uh, of March, um, so this episode has seen a lot of stress, as already uh, mentioned by, uh, by Rob in his presentation. Um, and we find that uh, asset managers in, during that period sold 11.1 billion um, pounds of corporate bonds in our sample, uh, which is really outstanding at seven times their average non-crisis uh, net trading. Uh, as a side note, um, as it may come as a surprise for, for some uh, 
business uh, hedge fund remained um, rather flat. Uh, and we find and dealers uh, were net buyers over that period, so they absorbed some of that selling pressure, but, but not all of them. Not all of that pressure. And during that period, we then find that uh, the relationship plays a particularly strong role with the uh, main effect. Uh, so the discount that the uh, relationship clients receive, it triples during that period. It's the, yeah, three times as large as pre-crisis. And it's given uh, mainly to those liquidity providing uh, clients that I've just mentioned and in trades that enter the dealer's uh, balance sheet. Now, uh, what do we learn from, from the results that, that, he, that, that we have presented here? Um, and to sort of prime a little bit the, the discussion that we might want to have and to combine this now with what uh, Evangelos has talked about, um, there's a lot of discussion around the design of this, of this market and whether the OTC structure um, is uh, really uh, advantageous compared to maybe exchange-based uh, trading. And our results here show that relationship um, play a strong role and relationships can only play a role um, where uh, the counterparties can identify uh, each other. So the over-the-counter structure gives a role to relationships and, and relationships really do play um, a significant role. Um, so that means that relationships here provide strong incentives actually for, for dealers to provide the liquidity. Uh, so that means relationship clients um, during stress times, um, benefit from that by having a source of liquidity that they can tap into. So that is something that is that is that might be said is, that, that's good. But then obviously relationships are not not every client can have a relationship uh, with the dealer. So the question would be how to improve liquidity um, supply for for those clients. But when we then think about the uh, exchange based trading, that means we must have some mechanism in place uh, uh, that actually uh, allows traders that want to supply liquidity to also do supply liquidity. So that probably means to have well capitalized firms that uh, can take the long term view in this market. And the market must also be sufficiently transparent to actually understand that there is a business opportunity here uh, to buy assets um, at a discount simply due to the selling uh, pressure that is uh, currently in the market. Uh, we find that um, there are uh, buy side clients that do provide liquidity uh, at times and uh, dealers incentivize this through relationship discounts. But then we could also think about how to um, design the market for other clients to actually uh, tap into uh, that liquidity. Uh, that would be then the, the auto op market that Evangelos mentioned. Um, and then uh, quickly just to mention that because that was a big topic coming out of the uh, financial crisis on proprietary trading, uh, given that we don't find that dealers offer relationship discounts to the informed client, that would be consistent with dealers no longer engaging in that proprietary trading. Uh, given that um, not engaging in this kind of behavior, there's just less, uh, say, uh, scope to profit from um, the information that uh, particular clients might have, uh, dealers simply do not offer those, those discounts to those clients anymore, given that they cannot really value from, from that information. Um, and that's, that's all. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Um, Jessica. A little bit technical issue here. Uh, Simon, please can you please stop sharing your screen? No, it's the uh, uh, preferences. <laughs> 
I wonder, Jessica, just in the light of time, if you want to um, talk to yourself. Yeah, if you can. Uh, I will set up the slides. Okay. Is that Matt Hale? There we go. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, well, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Kate. And uh, sorry about the technical issues. I uh, could just go to page two. Um, so just a brief summary of the paper. The paper first documents three uh, stylized facts about dealer client relationships and corporate bond trading. And then uh, the key uh, finding of the paper is the relationship clients obtain better pricing in the form of lower transaction costs. Then the authors try to tease out the different mechanisms that could potentially drive dealer client relationships. And page three. Thank you. Um, so, a key question in this paper is do relationships affect trading behaviors and liquidity in OTC markets? Why does this question matter? Prevailing theories of OTC markets generally neglect relationships, but empirical evidence about relationships in OTC trading generally points to the existence in, of, of relationships in OTC trading. So this paper contributes to the literature in two ways. So first, the authors use very granular regulatory data, and they provide concrete evidence about dealer-client relationships and bond trading, and they shed light on rich heterogeneity across clients. And secondly, the authors provide potential mechanisms that drive dealer client relationships in bond trading. Um, next slide. So um, I think a further question here that could be interesting is to go a little bit deeper on who exactly these relationship clients are. Uh, this paper suggests that most relationship clients are asset managers, which is a broad group. And liquidity benefit for relationship clients during COVID-19 crisis was driven almost entirely by so-called liquidity providing clients. And we know from some other papers on this episode uh, that there's acute selling of asset manager by asset managers such as mutual funds. So these evidence would point to heterogeneity across these asset managers. So another way to think about it is how are they fundamentally different? from the ones that are not relationship clients and the ones that are, uh, that are not liquidity providing clients. So before we go on, uh, we want to define who are relationship clients, what exactly is relationship. This paper and DiMaggio et al. 2017 define relationship clients based on trading volume and Hendershot et al. 2019 defines relationship in terms of repeated trading and network size. Um, so this question is important because it would help uh, shed light on how financial institutions are interconnected and how different potential mechanisms may interact. So in the next few slides, I want to go through this question and uh, connect it to uh, different areas in this literature. So first, uh, the paper suggests the dealer profit maximization is a key consideration here. Another consideration could be bundling. So how do dealers, other business lines, such as underwriting, prime brokerage, interact with trading? Um, and next slide. Um, and the next consideration is inventory risk sharing. So as we know from inventory control models, that transaction costs are increasing in inventory imbalance and holding costs. And these liquidity providing clients essentially share inventory risk with dealers. So decreasing inventory frictions and leading to lower transaction costs. And these inventory frictions tend to be high during times of stress and for balance sheet intensive bonds. So this would generate the result that's consistent with the results that we have in this paper, the liquidity benefit would be more pronounced during crises and for balance sheet intensive bonds. And in fact, Choi et al. 2021 connect relationship uh, with, with uh, inventory risk sharing consideration. And they suggest that clients are more likely to provide liquidity to, in, uh, to relationship dealers, which is kind of the other side of what this paper uh, is suggesting. And next slide. 
Thank you. Um, so the next, uh, in, in the context of information asymmetry, uh, we know from papers like Gloucester and Milgram that adverse selection increases higher transaction costs. And other research suggests the information content tends to be high when volatility is high. And there are several papers that suggest relationship and reputation mitigate repercussions of information asymmetries in trading. Um, so uh, this would also lead us to similar findings that relationship is associated with lower transaction costs, more so for information sensitive, uh, for example, riskier bonds and during periods of high uncertainty. Uh, so in this paper, I note the authors really point out to uh, point to information as information extraction, but this could be another way of thinking about information here. And finally, there is a literature in OTC search market, uh, it's search models that endogenously generate uh, the intermediary, uh, intermediary sector. So in these bilateral search models that uh, certain investors with certain characteristics would enjoy lower transaction costs and higher trading volume, which are akin to relationship in this paper. So that would generate potentially some of the same implications and would be another way to think about relationships in, the, in, in this context. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, and finally, I will want to touch on the policy implications. So first, on systemic risk and financial stability, from this paper combined with uh, the findings of several other related papers, that we know the core dealers and certain non-dealer financial institutions, such as the relationship clients and uh, liquidity providing clients in this paper, can have outsized impact on bond market liquidity, particularly during times of stress. Then also from this paper, we know that resilience of OTC trading during crises hinges on these liquidity providing clients. So again, understanding who these clients are could potentially have uh, wide policy implications. Then secondly, uh, post GFC regulations that constrain dealer balance sheet space heighten the role of relationships in OTC trading. So that effectively subsidizes a group of large institutions at the expense of smaller and less connected ones. And finally, as the assignment has already uh, talked about, uh, there's market structure design implications. So the importance of relationship hinders the development of all-to-all -all trading, uh, but all-to-all -all trading may be beneficial, especially in times of stress as it improves meeting rates and cuts out middlemen. Uh, so those are uh, all I have, and thank you so much, and sorry about the technical issues again. Thank you. Jessica, thank you. You had the disadvantage there of coming last as well, but you did a great job of trying to catch up with our time. Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters and discussants, and we have just a very short time for, um, for discussion, um, and we've covered so much ground here, so I suspect it's going to be quite challenging to, to, to get very much into the detail, but we have uh, two questions, I think. Perhaps one one we will pick up from the audience, um, and uh, and this is on your paper, Robert, which was um, I think relevant to some of the broader questions that we might want to consider as we step back and think about the implications of the of the research here. So the question from our audience member is: To what extent was the um, the U.S. asset hedging exposure due to monetary policy differences in the in the U.S. Um, versus the U.K. and the EU? Um, and the question coming out of that is the extent to which that phenomenon might happen in other circumstances uh, in a, a normal crisis, if if we can think of such a thing. Um, was the COVID-19 experience unusual and what did that mean? And I think um, indeed one observation is, is recent experience suggests that perhaps the nature of the exogenous shock matters when we think about how, uh, how that moves through the system and the need to take a systemic and holistic approach to understanding risks and thinking about the demand and supply side may, may be important. So taking all of that together, Robert, um, what do you think that tells us about some of the circumstances under which um, uh, imbalances could result in system-wide stress? Um, and specifically, what do you think are the potential implications um, from your research on that? Yeah, I mean, first of all, it's it's a great question. And um, I do think that it, it points to a very important point, and that's the, yeah, the, the flight to dollars in, in crisis periods, right? Um, so first of all, like our our analysis um, controls for all of that. So we we have time fixed effects that kind of um, then yeah account for different monetary policy decisions. So our our results are robust to that. But um, looking at the bigger bigger picture, 
um, and my my um, my colleagues also have have an excellent paper on that. Um, uh, what we've really seen is that a lot of investors uh, flew to the safety or perceived safety of of dollars, and um, yeah, that kind of yeah was driven by on the one hand the typical um, Gupinath Stein um, channel of uh, dollar liabilities. So you know a lot of for instance, the derivative contracts were also denominated in dollars, and therefore they needed dollar or needed access to, to dollar cash. Um, and secondly, of course, um, uh, the, the liquidity of, of, of dollar assets, which uh, plays plays a role as well. Um, so yeah, I, I do think that this is something uh, to keep an eye on, and uh, obviously a lot lot more uh, is to be done in that context. Um, but I hope, yeah, we we have a first uh, step in the right direction. Excellent, thank you. Um, Andreas, maybe I could bring you in at that point. Um, I know when you were doing your presentation, you were talking about some of the potential policy implications of your own research and the connections into this. Do you have any uh, any any thoughts on, on the back of that discussion? Yeah, thank you very much, Kate. So, so what I thought is uh, interesting because it, it came basically out in all of the three papers, know that um, sort of thinking about um, how to mobilize liquidity supply is important. And um, and maybe the market structure um, has a role to play here as well, um, you know. So and so so I guess in this regard, however, I mean we also have to be careful that anything there is um, any any change there is is, is essentially uh, very difficult. I mean, you know, there's a reason why organically we moved to where we are. So changing that uh, equilibrium is going to be. Quite difficult. So, so mandating any changes would um, would be probably quite disruptive. Um, there are reasons to think um, you know all to all can be helpful in channeling supply um, when there are bottlenecks with dealers. But then there are also other segments that we have seen, for example, that have an all to all structure, like the futures market uh, in the U.S. And that market was also pretty dysfunctional um in the march episode so it it seems to me that one needs to be careful uh, really needs to take into account the specific circumstances as well um and it's it's quite difficult to draw general conclusions so so unfortunately there's not really a silver bullet there in in my view but but still um looking at possible market structure changes um is is uh, promising thanks Thank you, Andreas. Um, and indeed, that was the question I was going to ask of Simon as well. Um, and I think we heard some um, from from you, your research suggesting that, uh, the importance of dealer client relationships. And Jessica raised some interesting and important points about the nature of market structure and particularly the the benefits of all to all uh, during times of stress. What do you what are your thoughts on that, Simon, and how we should be thinking about the implications of your research for uh, the way in which stress might might propagate? Thanks. Uh, yeah, I, I guess Andreas hinted to that by saying that um, even in the FX uh, market, you've seen uh, disruptions, even though they are largely exchange um, based. I, I guess the question is uh, where you can find the uh, the long term investor who is willing uh, to take short term pressure onto the balance sheet. Um, and one question might here be, for example, the extent to which you could bring in uh, Retail investors maybe um, wouldn't be particularly so so prone to temporary uh, pressures uh, in the market. But if you look just at the, uh, in our case, the corporate bond market, in in many ways, I guess it's uh, at, at the moment at least uh, impossible for them to participate in this market. Uh, the unit value of a corporate bond in many cases is already uh, one hundred thousand pounds or one hundred thousand US dollars. If you look at the just at the distribution of the par value of those uh, contracts. Um, so in, in that sense, it's not just a question of uh, the design of the market, but also having actually the appropriate investor base that is willing to participate uh, as the liquidity providing source, no matter what the market structure or for the given market structure. Simon, thank you. Um, we are starting to get some really interesting questions in the sidebar, but unfortunately, I think we now have to draw it to a close, including a really important one, I think, um, particularly on, on your paper, Simon, about what does the, the uh, heterogeneity relationships mean? How do we think about how do we think about how that plays out? Um, 
Thank you all very much for your presentations. Thank you to the audience for the questions. Um, I think there's at the beginnings of a debate here that's really interesting and important. Um, I'm sorry we haven't had longer to discuss it all, but thank you ever so much to everybody for the presentation of your research. I'm going to hand um, straight on to John Fell for the next session. Um, and thank you all uh, again for, for all, of your, uh, all of your participation today. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Um, so, <clears throat> given the global reach of this event, let me wish participants a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening, uh, depending on where you are. Uh, I'd like to, to begin by thanking uh, Dietrich Jemanski for inviting me to participate in this conference. And I'd like to thank also um, all the FSB colleagues that were involved uh, with the organization. So, <clears throat> back in 2013, uh, Janet Yellen, who was then vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board, delivered a speech um, at the joint luncheon of the American Economic Association and the American Finance Association on the topic of interconnectedness and systemic risk. Her speech began with the narrative of a financial crisis where losses arising from leveraged investments had caused a few important, but as she says, perhaps not essential, uh, financial institutions to fail. <clears throat> Initially, the damage appeared to be contained, but the resulting stresses revealed extensive interconnection among traditional banks, investment houses, and the rapidly growing and less regulated, what was called then uh, shadow banking sector. <clears throat> we don't call it that now, but we refer to it as the, the non-bank uh, financial intermediation sector. But continuing uh, with Mrs. Yellen's narrative, market participants lost confidence in their trading partners and as the crisis unfolded the financial sector struggled to cope with a massive withdrawal of liquidity uh, <clears throat> the collapse of one of its most prominent institutions and a 40 percent drop in equity prices now while this narrative may have seemed uh, vaguely familiar to observers of the global financial crisis this was not not actually the case study that she had in mind in her speech uh, nor was she speaking of the collapse of long-term capital management in, in 1998. She was actually referring to the unfolding of the banking panic of 1907, which was the event that argu arguably ultimately led uh, to the creation of the Federal Reserve uh, <clears throat> with a lender of last resort function uh, in, 20, in, in 1913. So <clears throat> while it might seem like the term interconnection and concepts like too interconnected to fail, only entered the lexicon of the financial stability experts in 2008 after the failure of Lehman Brothers, the notion <clears throat> actually has at least a century long uh, history. And every so often we are reminded of its importance. And most recently, of course, we again saw it in action uh, when the COVID-19 outbreak was declared a pandemic, triggering uh, a dash for cash and stresses in money markets. <clears throat> so against that background, the FSB developed high level analytical maps to support its holistic review of, of, of the March 2020 uh, market turmoil. And those maps uh, served as a starting point uh, for mapping financial interconnections among subsectors of the financial industry and the types of cash flows uh, that can lead to strains, margin calls, uh, for instance. Now, while this has improved our collective knowledge, uh, the exercise did run into, in, into obstacles, most notably uh, data limitations. Nevertheless, interest remains in identifying the main mechanisms through which uh, liquidity imbalances are tr transmitted through the financial system under what uh, circumstances these mechanisms act as an absorber as opposed to an amplifier of shocks and how interconnectedness in the non-bank financial in intermediation sector can be measured and monitored now against that background we have uh, in this session three complementary papers uh, which will try to answer some of these questions and we will also um, have three discussions. Uh, so the first paper um, is entitled Derivative Margin Calls, a New Driver of MMF Flows. Uh, it will be presented by Linda fash -Rusova. Linda is a team lead in the market-based finance division of the ECB's Director General for Macroprudential Policy and Financial Stability, and she holds a PhD in economics from the University of Munich. Uh, so Linda, uh, the floor is yours uh, whenever you're ready. Thank you, John. Um, uh, let me just check. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> 
so I suppose you see the slides, but they are not in. It's just a black, it's just a black screen for now. There, okay. yes, the, the slides are up now. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Uh, yes, so as um, John nicely introduced, uh, the title of this paper is called Derivative Margin Calls, a New Driver of Money Market Fund Flows. And uh, this is a joint work with Madalena Gio, Diliaria Salakova, and Herman Villegas Bauer. Uh, let me allow a disclaimer that uh, this presentation should not be reported as representing the views of the European Central Bank. So whatever I will be saying is the views of the authors and not necessarily of the ECB. Um, well, so what is the motivation for our paper? Uh, it's the March 2020 market turmoil and the large volatility in money market fund flows, where we have seen that between 13, 13 and 20 of March 2020, Euro era money market funds experienced experience outflows of nearly 8% of assets under management. You can see it in the chart where we have a further split of these money market funds into Euro denominated and uh, USD denominated uh, uh, funds. Uh, it was uh, then the responses by central banks that helped stabilize these outflows. So you see a vertical line for um, the uh, so-called PEP purchases enacted by, by the ECB. Um, well, so from this uh, money market fund flow outflows, there are of course important consequences uh, for financial stability and funding of the real economy, meaning uh, non-financial corporations, uh, governments, or 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 banks as well. Uh, but we we basically step back and say, okay, but what is the driver of these flows? What are the reasons? And what we noticed is that um, there is a strong correlation actually between this in and outflows from money market funds and variation margin calls faced by some sectors. So uh, the charts I show uh, show um, variation margin calls here in uh, blue uh, faced by insurance corporation and pension funds. Um, so the dynamics was that they first actually received variation margin calls, but then the market turned and they had to pay these margin calls back. And this correlates a lot with the uh, net flows into Irish and Luxembourgish Euro denominated money market fund flows. So this was kind of the motivation. And then we start to dig, dig into it in a more uh, systematic way. Uh, just coming back to the paper we have seen presented by Robert in previous session on the unintended consequences of holding uh, US dollar assets. Uh, basically, we also like in this uh, case of insurance corporation and pension funds, we can clearly link these variation margin um, flows to the underlying market moves. So these insurance pension funds, they hold especially interest rate and FX derivatives. And basically they were first actually the, the red is the interest rates, but reversed. So it first the interest rates first declined pension funds and insurers were getting variation margin. And then uh, there was a reversal in the interest rates. Uh, they, they increased sharply back. Uh, similar, there was also the dynamic in the FX, FX rate that was the focus on the previous paper. Okay, so uh, our main hypothesis is that this variation margin payments played a role that they could have driven the money market fund flows. There are other hypotheses in the literature that there were, for instance, flight to, fly to safety considerations, that there are certain characteristics of the money market funds, such as uh, the LV NAV structure, and that there are certain other specific liquidity characteristics of money market funds playing a role. So we don't want to challenge these reasons or considerations, but we say that in addition to these, um, there are also the variation margin payments, and this can be a new source of liquidity needs for institutional investors during crisis times. And uh, that actually these institutional, so usually non-bank investors, use money market funds for liquidity management, and therefore they pass the liquidity shock from the from the derivatives market, so from the variation margin calls there, uh, to up to the money market funds. Okay, uh, so how do we do this? Uh, we have three granular data sets. So on the one, 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 one hand, we have the 
fund by fund uh, Refinity Flipper data to have uh, like fund flows on individual fund level. Then we have we look at who is holding these um, funds, and this we do through the security holding statistics by sectors. And, and, and then we have another data set, the so-called EMIR data or the transaction by transaction trade repository data on derivatives that we have, which then tells us what, uh, what were the variation margin calls or variation margin flows faced by, this, by these investors into the money market funds. Uh, we have a bit of problem in one sense that the security holding statistics is only on country sector level. So this does not allow us to construct a whole chain of link of individual investors uh, up to individual money market funds. But what we do is uh, for the variation margins, we need to aggregate this on country sector level to, to, to show the link. So it's not as, as good as we would like to, but this is the only thing that is allowed uh, by the data that is available to us. We also focus then the analysis only on euro denominated variation margin payments because this is where we have a kind of full picture and we look at money market funds in Luxembourg, Ireland and France, which covers almost all the universe, uh, universe of these funds in euro area and we focus on the March 2020 market turmoil. In terms of the model specification, so we run panel regression, we distinguish outflows uh, faced by money market funds and inflows in order to allow for asymmetry in this. And then we, we regress this uh, on uh, the variation margin posted or received. Uh, in order to do the link, then we use a dummy for the fact whether this particular money market fund was held uh, by the investor group or, or not that was facing the variation margin uh, calls or was receiving variation margin. We also ran the model separately for each money market fund domicile because there are differences between the Irish, French and Luxembourgish money market funds. Um, uh, we also, you know, <laughs> Typically, we would have something like 200 country sectors, but we focus only on the most important groups in terms of both the large variation margin payments and also uh, that they are important holders of these specific money market funds. In both models, we would then expect uh, beta, our coefficient of interest, to be greater than zero if basically the, these investors group are using money market funds for liquidity management related to variation margin payments. I give you just a quick overview of the results for the outflows regressions. So the dependent variable is whether there was a money market fund um, outflow uh, in Irish, Luxembourgish, French money market funds separately. And, and then we see basically, so we have the different um, investor groups and we show uh, in the first regression on Irish money market funds that indeed uh, the motivation and chart that I, I showed you that they work also that it's not just about correlation that we also uh, get this uh, through regressions by controlling for for various other things and that basically we see that um, the variation margin um, payments the variation margin calls faced by Dutch uh, pension funds had indeed uh, impact on the outflows of Irish money market funds. Similarly, for Luxembourgish money market funds, we find an effect from uh, Luxembourgish investment funds. And then we have uh, for French money market funds, uh, the Luxembourgish and uh, French investment funds playing a role. Um, these effects are not only statistically significant, but also economically significant. So looking at the, the Dutch pension fund coefficient, we would say that uh, for each 1 billion um, that the Dutch pension funds had to post, uh, uh, the, the outflows uh, related to this from Irish money market funds uh, are estimated around 11 uh, million. Uh, but we would see this also more as a lower bound because we lose some variation through the aggregation to country sector, sector level, for instance. In terms of results and conclusions, so um, we show that the variation margin payments uh, faced by the uh, 
um, by some non-bank investors holding money market funds were an important driver of the money market fund flows. So margin posted uh, tends to increase money market fund outflows, meaning that some money market fund investors quickly read in money market fund shares to meet the margin payments. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we show that also margin received increased money market fund inflows in some cases for, again, for some investor groups. Uh, generally, non-banks, we showed that non-banks uh, used money market funds to manage liquidity related to margin calls in the March 2020 market uh, turmoil, and in this way, they also passed the liquidity shock to money market funds, and thus indirectly also to fundings of banks and uh, non-financial corporations, because these are the main, um, uh, main sectors that receive basically the investment from money market funds then. Uh, coming now to the um, uh, to the policy implications. So one um, policy implication would be we believe that the liquidity preparedness of non-banks should be enhanced to meet margin calls. Specifically related to this paper, we point at a risk of reliance on the cash-like properties of money market fund shares as a reliable source of liquidity under stress. So again, coming back to Robert's paper, this is this is quite in line uh, with with his uh, policy conclusions. Um, at the same time, also we think that the money market funds resiliency should be enhanced to significant outflows, and our paper uh, highlights that monitoring and a deeper understanding of interconnectedness is also important and. This uh, is also important in view of uh, regulatory reforms and by using new or enhanced data collections. So let me be a bit specific on, on the reforms. So we have seen OTC derivative reform out after the global financial crisis uh, that introduced stricter margining, uh, which of course on the one hand reduces the counterparty credit risk, but on the other hand, uh, it also increases uh, the liquidity risk and can create liquidity spillovers in the system through interconnectedness. Uh, at the same time, also this derivative reform actually brought us the trade repository data that enabled our analysis. Uh, without those, we would not, not be able to actually uh, look at this aspect at all. So, uh, well, one conclusion would be also that actually data are really needed for understanding the interconnectedness in 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 the, in the market. Thank you. That's all from me. Thank you very much uh, for that, Linda. Um, so we're going to go straight uh, to the discussant. It's, it's Alba Petosi. Uh, Alba is a PhD student in economics at the University of Cambridge, and her research focuses on uh, financial stability and macroprudential policies. So Alba, uh, you have the floor and your slides are up. Fantastic. But you are muted, um, Alba, we don't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, very Sorry, well. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't unmute myself, so this is what happened. Let me just um, do this in full screen. Um, brilliant. All right, so um, thank you very much, Linda, for the insightful presentation, and John for the awesome introduction. Um, in my discussion of this paper, I will first give you an overview of what the key issues this paper is trying to address are. Then I'm going to summarize how the paper addresses these issues and then um, finally give you a few comments on the paper. So just to give you a bit of background, it is very important to point out that the margin requirement reforms um, led by the financial stability board at the aftermath of the great financial crisis have brought significant benefits in terms of reducing counterparty credit risk. However, one cannot neglect the fact that these margins are highly procyclical and we see an increase in margin calls precisely in periods of high market volatility. This is particularly problematic because the investors facing these margin calls will be seeking liquidity at times when the capacity of the markets to provide liquidity is quite low, thus adding to liquidity risks. In an interconnected system, this poses a systemic threat to financial stability. So how does this paper raise this issue? First, the paper will ask, whether derivative margin calls uh, impact money market um, fund outflows. And it will answer this question by combining three very unique and granular data sets. 
Through a very robust and rigorous empirical strategy, the paper will provide us with strong evidence that one of the ways that money market fund investors manage their liquidity needs is by withdrawing from their money market fund accounts. Um, the, this paper has very important implications because the money market fund outflows that occur at times of heightened financial distress could increase liquidity risk and create spillovers in other segments of the financial markets. Now, in terms of a few comments, um, I'm gonna keep this quite brief, but first of all, I wanted to point out that this, this was a very nice paper. It's very well written and with a very rigorous data work and very important financial stability implications. Um, in terms of um, comments, first I wanted to point out that I was curious to see to what extent this um, outflows of money market flows result in money market stress. So I remember reading articles suggesting that these outflows may have led to a freeze in demand for commercial paper, which would of course have um, implications on issuance rates for both banks and non-banks. So I was wondering whether in the context of this paper, we could try and see to what extent these outflows have um, led to a reduction in demand for repos or potentially commercial paper. And then moreover, um, on the aggregate impact of these outflows on money market stress, I think it would be interesting to see how this derivative margin calls impact the net asset values of the very money market funds that are experiencing these outflows. And my second comment is on the liquidity constraints that the money market fund investors are facing. The paper makes a very strong case that one of the ways that investors are meeting their um, margin call obligations is through withdrawing from money market um, funds. However, I think it would be quite interesting to also look at potential cases where there's been delays in this uh, margin repayments or whether there's been um, cases of portfolio liquidation because these very investors could not meet the liquidity, um, these liquidity needs due to heightened liquidity constraints. Um, and then to kind of link this back to um, the investment groups constraint, while we see that there is um, this spillover to money markets, I think that there's probably, uh, and I think loads of uh, papers that were discussed in the previous sessions point to spillovers to other segments of the financial um, uh, sector. So I think it would be quite interesting to look at how else these investment groups are finding are funding their liquidity needs. In other words, do they have access to bank credit lines? Are they perhaps liquidating their um, their sovereign bond accounts? Are they perhaps borrowing from the money market uh, funds themselves? These are all questions that um, would shed a lot of light to the propagation channels of um, derivative margin calls. Um, and then uh, my other comment is on the portfolio analysis, and I'm not I'm not certain whether you could do this with variation margins, but I'm. I think this applies to initial margins. I was wondering whether there is a way of essentially decomposing um, the variation margins into two components, one that relates to um, the margin model sensitivity to market volatility, and another that relates to um, the broader sentiment in financial markets, which would have to uh, manifest itself in broker portfolio repositioning. If, if this is something we could do, it would be interesting to see what part of the variation margin is indeed um, causing these outflows in money market funds. And in the interest of time, I'm not really going to cover um, the last two points, um, but I can cover them offline if, if you would like me to. Um, but to sum up, I want to say that I've really enjoyed reading this paper, have learned a lot from it, and I'm really looking forward to seeing how the paper develops. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alba, and thank you very much for uh, your excellent time discipline as well. Um, so, I'm <clears throat> quite a few comments um, and also questions um, and constructive suggestions there uh, for Linda, but I, I would suggest we, 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 we pick them up um, at the end after we have the, the, the other two presentations done just before we open up for the general discussion. So we're going to go immediately to the second paper. Uh, it is entitled, You Can't Always Get What You what you want, where you want it, cross-border effects 
um, of the US money market reform. Um, and it will be presented by uh, Carol Alutkiewicz. Um, and Carol is currently head of the financial markets research section uh, at the Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, it's in the Director General for Markets. And Carol uh, holds a PhD from Goethe University. So please, Carol, um, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thanks very much uh, for the introduction, John. And first of all, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for putting our, our paper on the program. So this is joint work with Daniel Frick and Stefan Greppmeier, who are two of my colleagues at DG Markets at Deutsche Bundesbank. And as usual, the usual, usual disclaimer um, applies. So um, the views that I present here are my own views and not those of the Bundesbank or the Eurosystem. So let me first of all motivate the research question. So there's a huge ongoing policy discussion on money market funds um, due to two reasons. The first one is um, that uh, those money market funds have inherent instabilities. So they might face sudden redemptions and would need to potentially also fire sell assets. And the second reason for this policy discussion is that money market funds face strong growth. So globally, Total assets of money market funds have risen from 4.9 trillion in 2013 to 5.9 trillion dollars in 2017. And we also see huge increases in total assets in the euro area. Now, there are various reasons that have been proposed. Um, one is the low interest rate environment that we saw. So I think we now can use past tense here. And um, a second a reason for this growth, uh, and this is the one that we investigate in our paper, are cross-border effects, uh, particularly of those uh, that happened after the 2014 US money market fund reform. Now, let me be um, more specific on this US money market fund reform, uh, because it's very um, important to understand the changes that happened um, for our paper. So um, this reform had two elements. The first one, was the introduction of redemption gates and liquidity fees for all prime funds. So prime funds are those that mainly invest in uh, short-term commercial paper and uh, certificates of deposits, as opposed to, for example, um, public debt funds. And the second element of this reform was that in institutional prime funds, so as opposed to retail prime funds, were fo forced to switch from a constant net asset value to a variable NAV. So what does this mean? So variable um, NAV means um, basically mark-to-market -market accounting and constant net asset value means that um, those funds are allowed to um, account under the amortized, amortized cost approach. So um, those funds um, aim to offer their investors a steady share price of $1 uh, for $1 of investment. So they are characterized by a huge degree of money likeness. Now, if you look at the um, timeline, which I've put here um, at the top of the, of the slide, um, you see that the US reform was announced in July 2014 and implemented in October 2016. And there was also a similar reform happening in the Euro area, but this was announced later in June 2017 and the implementation started in January 2019. So there is no overlap um, between the two reforms in these two jurisdictions. And what we analyze is whether those investors that have a um, high preference for a huge um, money likeness of their investments, whether given that they had no longer the opportunity to invest in the US into those institutional prime CNET funds, whether they switched to the euro area because there it was still possible um, to invest in those CNF funds. And this actually brings me then uh, directly to our identification. So we use a plain vanilla diff and diff where we exploit this um, change in the reform and look at institutional US dollar focused money market funds in the euro area as um, treatment group. So let me very quickly give you a preview of my results. So we analyze uh, this reform-driven cross-border flows and find inflows of 50 billion euros um, to US dollar denominated, um, particularly prime CNFs that are based in the euro area. The effect is absent for prime VNFs. So um, this really points to 
uh, this flow is being motivated by the stable net asset value, so um, this money likeness, and not due to redemption gates or liquidity fees. And those the inflows are almost exclusively attributable to foreign investors, which gives really credibility that those um, flows that we observe are really reform driven. Now we also um, analyze economic consequences in the second part of the paper. And so we have economic consequences at the fund level where we find a weaker flow performance relationship and less risk taking. I will discuss that um, on the next slide. Um, and at the sector level, we find an increased concentration. And we also find that the MMF run that happened in 2020 um, was concentrated on those US dollar prime CNAFs, so those most affected by the reform, which then were called LVNF funds uh, due to the EU reform, and that that was driven by foreign investors that were kind of flighty. This is suggestive evidence. And uh, our main policy implication is that it is important to assess potential cross-border effects of future reforms, especially in the money market fund sector. So the data that we use are on the one hand side Morningstar Direct and on the other hand side the security holding statistics and we work with a sample of 121 institutional money market funds. Uh, the sample period starts in January 2013 so right after the euro area debt crisis and it lasts until May 2017 which is one month prior to the EU reform so really make sure that we don't have that in our sample. So let me directly go into the results, which um, here on this slide I show um, descriptively. So the red line shows you uh, prime scene of funds. So these are those um, that um, should be most affected um, by the reform and that should face cross-border inflows. Uh, the dotted lines are always um, the share of foreign flows in the total flows. Um, the green line shows public debt CNFs and the prime uh, VNF uh, funds are um, depicted by this uh, black line. And you see that those prime CNF funds um, face huge increases right before the implementation, which is the second vertical line. And this, um, count, um, this applies not only to all institutional funds, but also to those that are um, denominated in US dollars. So. Um, this is like the closest substitute for US, US investors, um, that the denomination, denomination is, is the same. So we also put this, of course, more formally. So these are uh, the results of our different diff, uh, regressions, where we regress the relative flows um, on um, those different um, different diff dummies. So the post dummy interacted with the US dollar dummy. Um, so the US dollar denomination and CNF. And I just want to draw your attention to column four. We find a positive and um, significant result here, which um, is like the main result of our paper that there are actually um, cross-border flows happening. This is the most um, yeah, saturated uh, regression where we also have controls and various fixed effect. Now, what um, this different diff result um, hinges on is um, the identifying assumption that uh, the parallel trends hold. We show this in the paper, but it's also very important in this different diff setup to also um, yeah, examine potentially contaminating events that might happen in the same time period, um, but that might um, yeah, have um, a different origin. And one of this contaminating, potentially contaminating events is US monetary policy. As um, in our sample period, um, which is depicted here with uh, this um, blue line, um, we saw an increase in the federal funds rate. So this um, increase started in 2015 and then lasted on. And Harris, we have about two minutes left. Okay, uh, thank you. And um, what um, what we can observe on this slide is that um, after the, um, the the Fed funds rate increased, um, we see an increase in uh, total assets of money market funds. But this happened much later, um, so this actually happened um, after our sample periods end. So we are confident that our results are not driven by by a U.S. monetary policy. So let me briefly talk about um, the economic consequences of our results. So 
Um, we view the reform as a negative shock to comp competition for your area based funds. So the general attractiveness of those funds increased um, investors are now willing to sacrifice some of the performance to achieve this desired stability. And this is what we depict here by looking at uh, our flow performance relationships. So for VNF funds before and after the reform, we see no change in the pattern of, of the FPR, but we see an increase um, um, a flattening of the FPR um, after the reform. So um, the FPR um, um, disappears. Um, and we also uh, examine a risk taking and we see that those funds actually now have fewer incentives for engaging in risk taking um, because they know that this will be not rewarded by additional flows. Now we also have results on um, concentration. We find that this increase increases, but I'll skip that uh, due to time constraints. And we also um, look at um, the COVID crisis where we find that um, in this um, March 2020 quarter, um, we see that the flows actually decrease, um, then um, this re re rebounds back to the to the pre um, to the uh, pre COVID crisis um, uh, level. But it is some suggestive first suggestive evidence that those funds were um, um, that the, the investors uh, were um, um, yeah flighty. Uh, during the during the crisis. So let me conclude. So our findings are that the US reform made euro area US dollar prime CNFs more attractive. We see large uh, foreign inflows and more stable uh, because uh, the FPR is lower and we see less risk taking. And the US uh, reform made the euro area sector more concentrated and less stable. Now there are uh, policy implications. Um, so there is um, an ongoing policy discussion and MF instabilities um, Actually, the FSB policy proposal of 2021 set the ground here and different jurisdictions then uh, came up with uh, specific implementations of those uh, policy proposals, which resulted in huge heterogeneities. So, for example, the anti-dilution tools uh, were implemented differently. Um, so the SSC is currently implementing swing prices, which we do not um, have in the euro area. So we think that there are um, yeah, potential heterogeneities and those heterogeneities um, can have um, yeah, potential spillovers. And um, yeah, no, we think that um, this is an yeah, interesting um, research field for future research. Thanks a lot. Very good. Uh, thank you very much um, for that, Carol. Um, so now uh, we will have the discussion. Um, our discussant is Don Hong Jin. Uh, Don Hong is an assistant professor of finance at the University of Hong Kong Business School, and she holds a PhD in finance from the University of Oxford. So please, Don Hong, the, fl the floor is yours. Yeah, just a sec. I think I'm not allowed to share my slides. Oh, you, I think you should be. <laughs> um, are you able to do it now? Uh, I will share the slide from, from Basel. Okay, very good. Sorry for that. I don't know why, but I, it seems I cannot share. Sure. Okay, we just wait until they are up. We just need full screen. Well, I'm very sorry for the delay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me to discuss this excellent paper. And uh, let's start directly. So this paper looks at the 2014 US MMF reforms. So the reform is designed to deal with the structural vulnerability of the US-based prime money market funds. And as the author has mentioned, the two crucial reforms include the introduction of redemption gates and liquidation fees, and also the switch from a constant NAV CNF to a floating NAV VNF. 
And because the paper is looking at the cross-border effects, so they zoom in to look at the sample period starting from the announcement of the reform in 2014 till right before the announcement for the EU money market fund reform, which is the mid-2017, the three-year window. Next page. So in summary, the paper found the cross-border effects of the 2014 reform being that the euro area monomic funds received significant inflows from foreign investors around the implementation of the reform, and particularly the USD-denominated prime CNAVs funds become more attractive because the authors show that they are largely within fund transfers. And this can be served as a negative shock to the competition to the eurozone, so that we see the euro area industry become more concentrated and likely more exposed to run risks. And the authors also used the COVID-19 as a test to show that this U.S. reform-induced foreign inflows are actually more fickle during the stress periods. The authors argue that the mechanism is mainly because the because of the search of, for the stable net, net asset value instruments rather than by the introduction of gates and fees. Because otherwise, we would see no significant difference difference between the prime NAV and CNAV funds. The U.S. reforms, therefore, had an intended stabilizing effect for prime CNAP funds in the euro area. Next page, please. So overall, I like the paper a lot. It is a great one, and it is the first empirical study on the cross-border effects of the 2014 reform, and it's a very important financial fragility issue. And here are my comments. Next page, please. So this is the overall of the time series variation in the monthly total assets under the management of the CNAV and NAV fund, uh, fund during the period from July 2014 to June 2020. And we can see the segment clearly that the VNAV funds manage about 57% of the total assets in the prime segments, with the remaining about 43% managed by the CNAV funds. Next page, please. So my first comment is, of course, on the investor clientele. Of course, I know the data is hard to get, but it would be very interesting or very important to see where are those inflows coming from. Is, are they from the CNAV or VNAV US funds? Are they like from institutional or retail investors? Or we know that when the funds adopt the floating NAV, there could be different number of strikes per day. So can we see any difference between the funds, say, using two strikes a day and the difference between the fund, say, using four to five strikes a day? whether the outflows are of the same or similar level. The reason I say this part is very important is because the CNAV funds and VNAV funds, they are exactly different. So they, these are endogenous, saying that they could aggregate different investor bases and they tend to hold different portfolio holdings. So therefore, whether they adopt the multi-strike or single-strike policy, whether they use more liquidity holdings, uh, what, what type of investors they aggregate, these three are determined together. There are actually papers in recent years, like the one by Casaventia et al. They show that these type of difference actually increases if the investor's flows are more volatile or say the investors are more sophisticated, as approximated say by the lower fund fees. So if we want to argue that the risk taking or portfolio holdings are related to the cross-border flows, then it's, we need to be extra cautious about the causality here because these three are determined at the same time. Next page. So that will lead to my second comment, which is whether there will be alternative explanation of the mechanism explained in the paper. So in the paper, in the paper, the main argument is that the cross-border flows were motivated by the search for stable NAV rather than by the introduction of gates and fees. So the first alternative explanation is that Okay, it is indeed that the gates and fees are of concern, but like I've mentioned on the previous page, the investor clientele differs for two types of funds. And the second explanation is here, maybe the gates and fees are not of that large concern, because as we can read from the reform, the gates and fees, they are optional, right? The reform said they permit a money market fund to impose a liquidity fee up, up to 2% or temporarily suspend their redemption for up to 10 business days in a 90-day window if the fund's weekly liquidity asset falls below 30% of its total asset and the board of directors determines that this is the optimal of their best, int best interest. Therefore, in reality, we actually see that most of funds, they didn't impose gates and fees at all. They always keep their liquidity holdings above this benchmark so that it will not trigger the fees or gates, so that that's not something that will reveal the negative information to the public market. 
So maybe the fees and case in this situation is not the fun concern and it's not something that the authors are comparing with as compared to the floating NAB. And we also need to disentangle the other channels. For instance, in the main regression, the authors never control the cash holdings, but we can see significant difference between the two types of funds in terms of their liquidity or cash holdings. And also because we're talking about cross-border effects, we need to pay attention to the cross-border difference. Right. In the Eurozone, we see that the swing pricing is another liquidity management tool and also other types of tools. These could be also be optional and some funds adopt, some funds not. So we need to pay attention that our results are not explained by, say, the adoption of swing pricing or not, for instance. Therefore, I would say a sharper identification would be we see the U.S. investors switch to the Eurozone after the 2014 reform and switched back after the Eurozone announced their own reform of money market funds. But that has been proved in the paper, which is not the case. So the authors provide explanation about the Eurozone reform itself, but I could also provide some alternative explanations, say, whether the authors take, care, um, take into consideration of the 2017 to 2018 U.S. debt ceiling crisis, could it be because of, again, some other liquidity management tools, say swing pricing in the Eurozone, etc. So that could make the uh, explanation more plausible. Next page, please. Don Hong, could you maybe try to keep the rest of your presentation a bit briefer, um, say under a minute or so? Please. Yes, of course. So this is um, related. We want um, it's just next page. I can skip this one. So overall, the authors said that next page, please. So overall, the authors is arguing that the floating NAV serves as a like harmful point because it harms the inflows for the U.S. funds. But then we why do we need the floating NAVs? We can see some facts like. During the 2022 U.S. reform, the SEC only removes liquidity fees and gates, but keep the floating NAB. And we can see also even before the Euro Eurozone reform, there are a lot of funds adopting the variable NAB, but less adopting the constant NAB. So I wonder for the investors, what is the trade-off between the two types of the, the NABs? And also maybe we can think of the negative interest rate effects. So we can see that the equilibrium effect is that the coexistence of constant and variable NAV funds, and that shows that investors in the VNAV funds are willing to pay a price to access this intraday liquidity. Then we want to assess why the floating NAVs matter or why the SEC still want to keep it. And also, if the paper can shed light on the 2022 SEC reform, that would be very interesting to see like, what is um, the importance of the paper and what it can be linked to the latest policy. And next page, please. I think these are my main comments, and the rest of them are some minor comments, including the difference I've mentioned for the two types of funds, saying that they could have different size, they have quite different cash holdings, and we see that the USD-denominated funds are significantly being more likely to be the CNAP funds. And also we see that for the CNAP and VNAP funds, and I also show, uh, next page, and the page after, yeah, just next page. The very last thing I want to mention is I want to ask whether there is a significant drop for the CNAP funds around the Q1 of the 2016 that hasn't been explained in the paper. I think that's it for the discussion. Sorry for the delay. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Don Hong. So now we can go to the third and final paper. Uh, it has the title Intraday Liquidity and Money Market Dislocations. Uh, the presenter is Quinton. Van de Veyer. Um, uh, Quinton is an assistant professor of finance at the Chicago Booth School of Business, and he holds a PhD in economics from Science Po at Paris. Quinton, you have the floor. Right. Thank you, John. So, can you see my slides? Just confirm. Yes, I can see them very well. Okay. okay perfect. So, thanks to the organizer for putting this pro this paper on the program. So, it's indeed called Intraday Liquidity in Money Market Dislocation. So, John Fork with Adrian Davana at the Stockholm School of Economics. So let me, okay, let me move to the first slide, which is really the main object of interest for these talks, the time series between the repo rate, uh, um, general collateral treasury repo rates, and the interest rate that's paid on reserves by the Federal Reserve. Um, and so what you can see on this slide is that the series features many spikes, and these spikes were originally of uh, reasonable magnitude, but eventually they culminated with three very large spikes one at year end 2018, another one in September 2019, and then a uh, last one in March 2020. 
And so if you remember in particular, uh, the September 19th spike attracted a lot of attention from the financial press. And I'm going to argue here that that's because this spike was very puzzling. It was puzzling for a couple of reasons. The first reason is that at the time, there was no real uh, economic or financial news happening. So it really took everyone by surprise. The second reason is that if you look at the total amount of reserves in the system that's available to banks, you would see that this is somewhat decreased uh, with respect to where it was in 2015, but it's still a very large uh, level uh, when thinking about it historically. It was larger than uh, 2010, for instance, after the first wave of QE. Um, the third reason is that you look at this uh, average peak daylight overdraft at the Fed, which is a measure of how much banks are borrowing intraday liquidity with the Fed, you also see no sign of stress. Like there's no pickup in liquidity needs uh, coming from that metric. And then the last reason is that uh, you normally expect banks to extend their uh, lending in repo markets whenever the spreads, the repo spread is larger. And what we see in this graph is that that's, this is what they typically do when the spread is larger than they tend to increase their uh, repo lending positions. But it's also what, not what happened in September 2019. And we see that that has a lot of liar here in red. Uh, during these days, actually, the uh, banking sector um, jointly decreased uh, repo lending despite uh, the spreads being so large. So there is a puzzle. We still don't understand uh, what's been driving these, these spikes, in particular, what's the reason behind these very strong nonlinearities. And that's an important question because uh, the repo market is a core funding market for shadow banks, or as we call them nowadays, non-bank non, non financial institutions. Um, and we do, don't, don't really know why. So why, why could that be? So let's ask, uh, actually, somebody asked uh, during a, um, a press conference, the CEO of JP Morgan, why did it not lend more despite the spreads being the spreads being so large, and the answer in the following way, pointing to intraday liquidity shortages. So let me just highlight uh, some part of this uh, long quote. He said, we believe that the requirement under CELA and resolution and recovery is that we need enough in that account, so their account, their reserves account at the Fed, so that if there is extreme stress during the course of the day, it doesn't go below zero. So it's really pointing towards the scarcity of intraday liquidity that's, drive, that's been driving has been driven by these uh, new uh, liquidity regulations. Okay, so what do we want to do in this paper? We want to uh, answer the question, what drives this money market dislocation that we see in the data? And in order to do so, we are going to extend a seminal paper uh, for monetary policy implementation, this full 1968 paper of the Fed funds market. And we are going to extend it in order to account for repo market and, sh and shadow banks. And the idea is that the repo market is the place where shadow banks can trade liquidity with, with banks. What we also need in this model is that we need to explicitly uh, model all of the flows that are going on because we want that any transaction reacts, um, results in a non flow of reserves for banks. And then the last point is that uh, we are going to impose this intraday liquidity regulation as close as possible to what we think the regulation actually looks like. So it's going to be a stress test and the stress test gives the banks a certain amount of reserves that they get to use within the day. And whenever they, they, they are done, whenever they use all of this, then they cannot do anything anymore. And we are going to argue that uh, the combination of these three elements can actually explain the pattern that we see in the data. And then, and then we try to understand what are the different macroeconomic factors that are making uh, the probability of repo spikes more or less uh, uh, likely. Okay, so I don't have the time to go into full details of the models. So what I'm going to do rather is to uh, use this graphical representation to give you an idea of what's going on. So we have uh, two policy agents and three uh, actual agents. So we have households. What households do is that they invest their own net worth plus their future tax liabilities into repo and deposits. And they have some preference for, for these liquid assets. Um, so they have deposits with uh, traditional banks, repo with shadow banks. The idea is that in reality, they don't do it directly, but they do it through money market funds and like a long chain, chain of intermediation. Um, and then shadow banks here are basically borrowing in repo in order to finance the portfolio of treasury bonds. Uh, then you can think about these as being just fixed like these um, um, uh, relative value hedge funds that are trying to arbitrage the cash future basis or something like that. They are warehousing these treasury bonds. Then you have the traditional banks, they take the deposits and they use it to hold some securities or loan book. Uh, they also hold some reserves because there is some liquidity transformation going on. So they are taking some liquidity risk and they hold reserves as a buffer against liquidity risk. 
And then whenever it's profitable for them to do so, they can also issue repo and then lend to shadow banks in, the, in that way. Then we have the treasury. Treasury issues the T-bonds against future, future tax liabilities, also has a reserves account at the, at the central bank. And then the central bank uh, holds the, the T-bonds, also on T-bonds and swaps it against reserves, uh, both to regional banks, but also to the treasuries, to the tre treasury accounts. Okay, so the timing of the model, so we have really two sub-periods in the economy. Most of the markets trade in the morning, whereas the money markets actually trade in the afternoon. And what's very crucial here is that at the beginning of the afternoon, the households wake up and they get an aggregate uh, repo preference shock. So they realize that suddenly they prefer to hold, for instance, uh, less repo and more deposits. And that's going to be your supply shock. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you have a late deposit shock, which is creating this liquidity risk for banks. Okay, let me jump to the results. So our first result, we are looking at the benchmark economy in which the LST constraints, so this liquidity, intraday liquidity constraint coming from the, from, from the regulator does not bind. And in this case, we find uh, a similar result as in the traditional model, except that now we also have this repo market. But basically in this world, banks are acting as arbitrageurs between the Fed funds market and the repo market. So the repo rate and the Fed funds rate also always have to be equal. And they have to be, and they are bounded below by the interest rate that's paid on reserves, and they are bounded above by the discount window rates. And so that's what we see on the left hand side. We have a graph that looks exactly like any graph of monetary policy implementation. We have a demand for reserves that's decreasing, and then we have a supply coming from the central bank that determines the Fed funds rates. And, and the, the combination of these two is actually going to determine what's the supply of repo coming from banks, which we see on the right hand side. That's this uh, red line. And we see that. This is going to be upward sloping because the banks are doing this arbitrage. They are moving funds from the federal market to the repo market, making sure there is no spread between these two. Uh, what's important here is that we also have the supply coming from the shadow banks, net of the of what the households of the demand coming from the shadow bank, net of the supply from households. And we see here this is very inelastic. So that's by design. We want to capture something that's quite inelastic up to the point where, um, at some point, shadow banks find it more profitable to actually fire or sell their securities then uh, keep, keep by paying the repo rate. Um, okay, so what's going on in this case whenever you have a, a repo demand shock? Well, in this, in this graph, I have the same as before. The only thing that I'm adding is that I also track down how much reserves there is in the economy. So I have the amount of excess reserves, and then I have the amount of reserves that are used that are necessary in order to settle intraday all of these transactions. So in this case, we see there is enough reserves in order to settle everything, and then you see a repo uh, demand shock. So what happens here is that the, um, the repo rate increases, but up more or less to the discount window plus, plus stigma rate. And the, and the reason why or the, the, what makes it possible to do so is because banks can borrow uh, within the day at their overdraft. They can get intraday liquidity, so they can also settle these transactions and then make sure that the rate uh, doesn't go above the discount window rate. Okay, so what's going on now uh, whenever you have this LST constraint that's fine? Well, we have two things that change us. First, the repo rate can jump above the discount window rate. And then we all would also, in this regime, no, see no transaction in the Fed funds market. And the fundamental reason is that uh, the discount window only provides overnight liquidity, but does not provide intraday liquidity. And so that's something you can see graphically, such a representation of the world after QE and a new regulation. So we see there is now much more excess reserves, but a bunch of these reserves are locked for this uh, intraday liquidity. So you cannot access them. And so what happens in this case, whenever you have a shock, well, you see that the supply um, of repo now has this kink. So whenever there is the shock, the repo demand shock, what happens is that the quantity of reserves that's necessary uh, becomes completely inelastic because it eats at some point the amount that is needed to fulfill this uh, liquidity regulation so that the repo rate jumps up above the discount window uh, level. And so that's the repo spike that we uh, think we see in the data. Okay, so let me move quickly to the last two results of the paper. Then we look at what happens whenever there is uh, a change in fiscal policy and monetary policy. And we find that monetary, uh, fiscal policy has uh, three cumulative impacts, or three uh, is going to have an impact that's cumulative in three different ways. Um, and so that's what we have here. The first way is that the multi-bonds increases the demand for shadow bank repo financing. So if your multi-bonds, these have to be financed by shadow banks, so this increases the repo demand. So it gets closer, the two lines gets closer to eating each other. Uh, in, in the king part. Then you also saw that the larger treasury account, so whenever the treasury finance uh, creates more treasury, it gets into the account that's basically neutralized some of the reserves for banks. And so this basically decreases 
uh, the amount of reserves that is available to the banks. That's what we see here. And that means that the repo supply moves to the left. And then the last one is that the largest spot insurance of T-bonds increases the settlement needs for reserves. So the constraint actually happens to be more binding exactly at the time where the T-bonds uh, increases. And so in this case, because the, we have more uh, LFC that gets locked and also the repo supply here moves to the, to the left. Okay, then turning to monetary Lincoln, policy. You, you have about two minutes left. Yes, but that's perfect. I'll, I'll be done by now. Okay, so for mon monetary policy, so what happens, the same idea, basically you have um, um, a contraction in monetary policy, for instance, in reverse, through reverse QE, is going to affect the probability of a repo spike through two different channels, because it's going to work both on the asset side and liability side of the central bank balance sheet, which is what, what we see here. So the central bank contracts, you have less reserves that are available, available to uh, regular banks and so less arbitrage capacities for these. Uh, and then at the same time, the central bank also releases some more T-bonds in the market, which means that now the shadow banks have to hold more of these T-bonds. And because they have to hold more of these T-bonds, this means that the repo demand uh, actually increases. So we see a, a move, a simultaneous move in the, in the repo demand and the repo supply that makes it uh, such that the probability of a spike is actually larger. And then moving to the last result of the paper, which is that uh, dynamically, we find out that the interest rates or the yields on treasuries has actually to increase in proportion to the probability of a spike. And the intuition here is quite straightforward. So the shadow banks are doing this arbitrage trade, but they are actually taking some liquidity risk in, do in doing so if there's a, a positive probability of a repo spike. The larger the probability of this repo spike, the more they are going to ask for a compensation for, holding, for doing this liquidity transformation, holding some liquidity risk. And so another way of saying that is that the moneyness of treasuries really comes from the fact that you can use them as collateral in repo markets. If the repo markets don't work properly, then they are much less useful. So this brings me to my conclusion slides. We propose a theory that explains recent disruptions in money markets. And the theory is consistent with four empirical puzzles. We non-linearities non come from that we have these hard constraints, plus also additive effects on, on both fiscal and monetary policy. Uh, the, the second is that the spikes, the spikes are happening despite very large reserves, but that's because now the scarcity is in intraday liquidity, not in overnight liquidity. And intraday liquidity can be much, demand can be much larger, much more volatile. Uh, the third one is that there is, uh, we don't see the data in the increase in daylight overdraft. Here this is generated in the model because in order to get an overdraft, you need first to be able to go to zero, which is exactly what this constraint is. So reducing actually the repo lending in September, well, this is completely possible if the LST becomes more binding during the days of large settlements, which was exactly the case in September 2019, which was a, a high tax days. And so this also illustrates the need for permanent uh, repo facility as uh, recently is introduced by the Fed. And this is my final word. Thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Quentin. So <clears throat> the discussion is Marcin uh, Kaczpercik. Um, he's a professor, Marcin is a professor of finance at uh, Imperial College London, and he holds a PhD in finance from the University of Michigan. Okay, thank you very much, uh, John, uh, for uh, inviting me to discuss this uh, really interesting paper. I tried to squeeze within the five minute time. I know we are a little bit over uh, time budget. So, so this is a paper about uh, money markets and the context of the uh, kind of a, a little bit of a narrow uh, framing, which is the uh, repo market. But generally speaking, what I want to start with, uh, and this is where this paper kind of fits in and the whole conference, that money markets can become extremely important uh, for, for various reasons. And uh, we don't have time to discuss those, but uh, definitely one of the reasons why uh, money markets are important is uh, this idea of uh, sudden uh, changes in liquidity and uh, potential uh, pricing effects resulting from that. So, so what the paper starts with is a, a set of uh, different uh, puzzling results, uh, the results related to the uh, uh, repo rates, the results related to overdrafts, and also the nonlinear behavior between the uh, rates and the amount of lending that is done in the uh, market. So briefly to kind of flash the slides that uh, uh, Quentin already has shown, I think this is probably the most uh, puzzling uh, uh, slide uh, to motivate uh, the paper, which is essentially the spread between the uh, repo rate and the reserve uh, rate, which uh, by no arbitrage conditions should generally uh, fluctuate around uh, zero. 
but what you see is essentially these deviations from the no arbitrage type of uh, uh, paradigm at uh, certain times uh, and especially if you look at the magnitudes of these deviations some of them are really enormous and and i think this uh, have very uh, important uh, economic implications for many actors uh, in this uh, market and on top of that, there is this notion that uh, with the increase in the repo uh, rates, of course, one would expect that banks are going to be uh, more engaged in the amount of lending, which uh, generally speaking, this uh, picture uh, shows you is the case, except that you see basically uh, some kind of episodes when actually this uh, does not necessarily follow what the predicted uh, path of this uh, particular behavior uh, would be. So what is it that this paper is trying to do? This paper is trying to actually think of an economic model that could actually rationalize some uh, this and other uh, facts that Quentin has also uh, alluded to and uh, propose a model that is kind of unified in the sense that it can explain many of these facts uh, consistently at the same time. So this is what uh, the first part of the paper is. And then uh, what the authors are also trying to uh, talk about is to uh, try to assess a little bit the predictions of the model against uh, some specific uh, dislocations, especially the ones that uh, Quentin has uh, mentioned in 2019 and uh, 2020. So I don't have a lot of time, but I think uh, what's nice about this paper kind of to uh, give you a big picture idea is that this is a very kind of uh, uh, overarching model of the uh, intraday activity of, of the whole kind of money system. So we have uh, a lot of players that are actually uh, explicitly uh, modeled here. And in particular, what I like uh, about the paper is, first of all, this uh, aspect of the intraday activity. So normally we tend to think of, uh, of a lot of these uh, players as kind of uh, moving on a day by day basis. But of course, when it comes to uh, money markets, uh, intraday uh, business is extremely important. And that's exactly what the model uh, kind of gets at. So there are two periods that are uh, kind of separately analyzed by the model. And then the additional twist, which I really like a lot about this paper, is this interaction between the banking uh, and the shadow banking uh, system. And the reason, of course, is that there are important regulatory differences between uh, what uh, banks and uh, shadow banks uh, can actually do in the course uh, of their actions. So when you think about uh, what really drives a lot of the results in the uh, paper, and uh, I really encourage everyone to read uh, the paper because it, uh, it has a lot of detail, very interesting uh, kind of results, which I cannot give justice to, is this idea of uh, regulation uh, that is inspired by the Basel uh, Free Framework. So essentially, uh, following the GFC, the global financial crisis, there was uh, an emphasis on the uh, kind of access to liquidity that is provided by the banking sector. So as one of the kind of stipulations of the Basel III was essentially this idea of uh, uh, keeping an extra buffer that could uh, potentially mitigate any kind of uh, shocks to uh, depositors, withdrawers, uh, etc. And uh, the authors embrace that particular uh, uh, constraint in a san some kind of uh, exogenous sense, and they try to analyze the predictions of the model in the uh, case in which this constraint is binding uh, versus when this constraint is uh, not binding. So I don't have a lot of time to go into each specific comment. So in the interest of time and kind of giving a little bit of a bigger picture uh, questions uh, for the authors and maybe for the audience to think about, I've posed uh, four questions, which to me were kind of questions that I would like to know a little bit more about. So the first uh, question, of course, uh, that is at the core of this paper is, why did we actually introduce this constraint? Uh, to what extent uh, was the regulator, in this particular case, uh, the Basel Committee, uh, potentially internalizing some of these uh, unintended uh, consequences? So the paper is uh, very explicit and very detailed about uh, what are the different elements of the regulation. But I think uh, what would be interesting uh, to see is a little bit more of a broader perspective on, on what was the kind of benefit and the cost that could potentially be associated uh, with this particular uh, regulatory uh, regime. And in particular, I would like to have some kind of discussion of uh, some uh, welfare uh, uh, implications. And uh, if a regulator is benevolent and is trying to improve something about the uh, macroeconomic environment, you would expect to see some kind of uh, welfare improving uh, motivation that uh, led to this particular uh, regulation. So the second comment uh, which uh, I would like the authors to think a little bit about uh, is this idea of uh, how we should think about uh, this uh, constraint. Uh, clearly, this is the key uh, kind of uh, aspect of this paper because a lot of traction in the model is actually driven by this uh, regulatory constraint. Uh, 
And of course, the question that is uh, typical is, should we think of this constraint as a truly exogenous constraint with respect to the uh, kind of uh, uh, dislocations that you observe in the data, or is there uh, some kind of adjustment that is happening uh, on the side of the financial market such that uh, the market kind of anticipates what could be the unintended consequence of this kind of constraint? So, so I, I understand that uh, endogenizing uh, the implications of this uh, constraint on the agents may be uh, difficult from the perspective of uh, modeling the shocks that actually uh, drive uh, these uh, deviations in the uh, data. But I think it would uh, help me understand how is it that the market, in some sense, adapts uh, to this uh, new kind of uh, uh, regime that uh, the regulator poses on it. And finally, I, I, I acknowledge the fact that the model is very rich, and of course there are many things we can do and not uh, do, but at the level of uh, policy and some kind of understanding of uh, what this regulation really does, it will be useful to think a little bit uh, more seriously about the quantitative aspects of the model. So, so in particular, uh, the, there are issues related to uh, how much uh, banks want to hold of the capital against these unexpected shocks, what is the kind of distance to uh, the constraint uh, that uh, the banks and the shadow banks are kind of facing. So I had kind of little guidance from the paper to understand how serious this is actually in terms of quantitative uh, aspects of it. How should we think about the uh, different kind of uh, moments in the data to actually predict what this uh, basically uh, binding uh, episodes are going to be? So anything that the authors could provide in, in terms of motivating this uh, kind of questions would be extremely uh, useful and important. And I'm sure that uh, policymakers would definitely welcome this kind of additional discussion. But overall, I want to say that this is a really impressive piece of work. I've learned a lot from this paper. I think it is a great model to kind of think about the issues of this conference, and I strongly encourage everyone uh, to think about and read the paper in more uh, detail. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Marcin. Um, so I'm going to give um, each of the speakers, um, let's say, a minute, a minute and a half uh, to come back on um, issues that were raised by discussions and, and questions. Um, I mean, so I, I would. I would advocate to be to be selective um, because we, I mean, we, we we won't have time to deal with all of the issues that came up. So if I could start with Linda. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, so many thanks to Alba for for the good discussion of the paper. Uh, I think. Um, Basically, our paper is still a work in progress, and uh, I think there are two key issues that uh, how we could expand the paper. One is to not to look only at variation margin flow, uh, variation margin flows, but also to the initial margins. This is something we have not done yet, uh, but we could potentially also do it. Um, and second is to look at different types of uh, liquidity sources. So we kind of handle only the money market fund aspect, but certainly there were other liquidity sources used uh, by non-bank sector to meet the, the margin calls. Uh, on that, uh, I, I think this is rather lack on, of time and also uh, limitation on data. Uh, so in particular, actually, what would be useful, I think, is to look at the repo market uh as, a, as another source of liquidity on the topic of whether there was selling of bonds uh so yes from the shs data we unfortunately have only quarterly data uh so it's difficult even if we see any any moves there uh to relate it directly to to the stress or to this like um, 10 days when there was the dash for cash period uh so uh i think there for instance bank of england <laughs> Has, has better data and can do a better job. Uh, still, I would say we have not seen such big um, uh, like sales. Uh, so looking at the quarterly data, we have not seen such big sales of the insurance and pension fund sector. So uh, during during this quarter, so uh, I think other sources of liquidity could potentially have play play a bigger role, like like for instance the repo market. But I think these were all very, very valid comments. Also, looking at bank, bank credit lines, we could, we could do more work on that. Uh, so, thank you. I would stop here. Perfect. Uh, thanks a lot, Linda. Uh, Carol? Yes, thanks a lot. So, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for the wonderful discussion. 
I think there are many points raised um, that we will um, definitely look into. Um, so um, let me um, just comment on, on a couple of ones. So first of all, um, this question that you raised about where the inflows are coming from. So I think that, that we have the data and we could look into that. Um, in the paper, we have the results um, that um, those inflows that we see are actually happening within fund family. So we have this result that um, those fund family outflows are correlated with um, the inflows that we observe in the UI area funds. And we could look into those um, fund family um, outflows um, in, in, in a little bit more detail and split them into, into CNF and VNF. And I think that this could, could has some potential um, to generate um, interesting further results. So thanks a lot for that. And um, maybe maybe let me also comment um, on the point that you raised regarding the EU, EU reform. So um, in the second part of our paper, we look um, also at the EU reform and find that there is no reversal of, of the flows. So, so those inflows that we see that are coming from, from the US, as we argue, um, that they are not um, going back once um, the EU reform is implemented. And I think um, that, that the reason for that is that actually um, the switch from CNF to LVNF was not such a substantial switch as um, it was um, in the US where the CNF funds disappeared and there were actually just VNF funds um, in the prime segment. Um, so this LVNF category in the EU is um, actually pretty similar to, to, to the CNF category and it was not such a hard switch um, as it was in the US. Um, yeah, but thanks again for the for the nice discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Carol, and then Quentin. Right. So thanks, Martin, for the great discussion. Um, let me just pick up on two of your comments. So the first one um, would be on the on the shock trigger. So that's actually very good because I didn't get a chance to be more explicit. So the way so of course the way we model the shock is very reduced form. But what we really mean to capture is any shock to the to this intermediation chain. Uh, from money market funds, from households or non-financial non corporations to the supply of repo to the guys that are on the other side of that, which is most likely hedge funds or asset managers. And so, for instance, the type of shock we have in mind would be the things we see on quarter ends where we see the foreign foreign banks, uh, foreign from the from a U.S. perspective, I guess, uh, get their, uh, for window dressing reasons, have to contract their balance sheet. So that hampers this strong distortion. Something else would be uh, whenever you have a tax a tax period, then you have uh, all of these big corporations that are moving away the funds from their money market funds, and then this basically gets used to pay wages uh, within the public sector. So this gets uh, reshuffled into the building. We see these seasonal shifts uh, that that are happening. Um, just on the let me just mention uh, on the quantitative side that we are actually working on on doing just that uh, at the moment. So hopefully in the next iteration we'll be able to say something about that. Okay, it looks like Marcin is satisfied. I see a lot of nodding going on in response to your to your to your answers, uh, Quinton. So um, yeah, I mean before opening up the, uh, to the general discussion, um, I think it might be useful to briefly recap on on, on the issues that we were hoping to address. Um, in this session, I mean, I think some of it has already, um, I mean, just I mean, by, by virtue of the nature of the papers, I, mean, I think, I think um, it, it has been helpful in identifying the types of linkages that are, are relevant from a financial stability. But there was this issue about um, the main mechanisms uh, through which liquidity imbalances are transmitted through the financial system, and in particular, um, under what circumstances those mechanisms um it can act as an absorber of shocks rather than as an amplifier so what can we do to uh to reduce uh pro cyclicality I, mean, I, th I think all of you had something to say on that and i'm not i'm not wouldn't ask yet that you that you answer because what i would what, what i would like to do in the interest of time is gather is gather a couple of questions um because i've seen um already um we have um I'm getting the questions are arriving in different in different places, so you have to bear with me. I've got one question from uh, Yoni Alton, and uh, who would argue that the leverage ratio is the most binding constraint for the banks to extend their re their repo balance sheet capacity. That is why the temporary Fed facilities are exempt from the SLR. Uh, did you consider the impact of 
of, of, of SLR. I mean, I don't know whether that, I, I think you are, you were asking that question to the whole panel, although um, perhaps Quinton has, has views on that, but as I said, I will gather um, the, uh, the questions I did see um, in the chat with panelists. Yeah, we have a question to all the speakers from uh, EF, AMA, uh, thanks for the presentations. Um, and the question is, well, the comment is that the, that the analysis <coughs> uh, presented uh, of the money market flows appear static. Um, I don't know if this is, is in reference to the first presentation and a dynamic analysis would show uh, flows reversing considerably in the, in the following month in April, um, questioning the seriousness of MMF outflows from a systemic perspective. Um, have you considered flow behavior after March? Well, I mean, I think arguably, I mean, if you have a, if you have a bank run, you have a bank run. If you have a run, um, yeah, it, it, it could come back, but there might be nothing to come back to. But I mean, I'm being um, <laughs> preempting possibly the answer uh, that, that Linda might have on that. And I don't see anything else for now. So, um, Linda, do you want to? Yes, uh, thank you, John. Uh, I think uh, one is to distinguish two issues. Um, first of all, so the money market fund outflows dynamic, and then what we show in our paper, which is the link between variation margin and money market fund flows. So first of all, on the money market fund flows dynamic, um, yes, uh, fine, the flows reversed. Uh, after March 2020, uh, but uh, I have shown this one chart that shows that actually the reversal point is very much linked to the same time, the same day when there were heavy unprecedented interventions by central banks. Uh, so, I don't know, the ECB uh, 18th of March <laughs> announcement of PEP and a few days later, the start of the PEP, uh, for instance, the pandemic emergence purchase program, right? Uh, Bank of England, I think Robert also presented uh, like uh, interventions by um, the Bank of England. Uh, US Fed may also have interventions. And uh, so, like looking at the systemic perspective, I am just always questioning myself, what would have happened if there were not these interventions? And plus, these interventions are also costly. They bear risks. So, um, so I think, and, and plus there were also, of course, other interventions by other public authorities, the fiscal authorities, uh, guarantees, uh, many things were done. So uh, I think it's about the, um, like how the financial system can, can bear, um, how the financial system have capacity to handle this themselves or whether we want to, you know, sh shift somehow this uh, fragile <clears throat> balance or, or like where we want, <laughs> whether we want the central banks always to, to intervene or uh, under which likelihood we want them to intervene. So, so the fact that there was a reversal, I think, does not say anything about uh, like low potential systemic implications from the from the event. Uh, so this is the first second on the link between variation margin uh, and, and money market fund outflows. Yes, I, I think we can elaborate on this maybe a bit more in the paper. Uh, basically, or we can run a regression on column period. Basically, I would not uh, um, expect to find any effect because, of course, if uh, uh, if let's say non-banks have sufficient amount of deposits uh, or even, you know, they post some excess collateral. So if the margins are paid from, from this, I mean, there is no need for them to reach out to like more non-standard sources of liquidity, like money market funds or repos or selling bonds. So so I think, yeah, we can do more work, work on this, but I don't expect any, any big results there. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Uh, Carol? You want to pick up any on any of those issues? Yeah, thanks. So regarding the question uh, whether the flows are um, reverse or that the flows are reversing and um, then maybe um, questioning the seriousness um, of those flows uh, from a systemic perspective. So I think Linda has made a good point by um, pointing to those very stabilizing me uh, measures that were implemented. And I think that they um, yeah, actually took out some stress out of the market and they um, 
actually caused this reversal flows. So um, yeah, we, we also observed them. We, we observed this, this reversal um, in, in our paper. So um, in the month after um, March 2020. Um, um, yeah, what, what, what our results really point to is um, that um, especially those um, flows that we saw uh, that were due to foreign investors, that they are very fickle and um, that points to to yeah that they, they are pretty pretty flighty and we should just bear in mind um that um um yeah that this could also happen in the future but yeah but i think that the, the main response was really this that there were various measures implemented that took out the stress um, um also by 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 by, by the central banks etc okay uh thanks for that carol um I've got Andreas Schrimpf is asking, um, he, he has a question related to Quinton's presentation. Can, can Andreas speak? Yes, let me, let me just pose the question quickly to Quentin and then uh, there's another remark that I would like to make. Um, so regarding Quentin, um, there's also quite a bit of evidence that the, uh, that some institution, because for example, they sold a lot of assets to the Fed uh, through QE, they have uh, accumulated large reserve balances. So I was wondering, to what extent, you know, such redistributional frictions from the fact that you have um, really highly skewed distributions of reserves matter for the results, and you know, maybe, maybe that's an avenue also for you to consider uh, um, in the model uh, if you think it's relevant for the for explaining the results and explaining maybe some of the elasticity in the supply. Um, and, and the other thing that I just wanted to mention quickly as a remark uh, relates to um, liquidity regulation. So, I mean, it's a while ago now that this event happened, but it was also, um, um, I remember being discussed that the LCR liquidity coverage ratio wasn't a binding constraint in that period. So that's, um, there, there was a significant headroom that all the banks had um, over that uh, ratio. And so what's much more relevant um, and, and that's also discussed in Daryl Duffy's paper is um, is um, uh, jurisdiction specific liquidity regulation that comes on top of the international agreed one, and especially the CLR regulation. And so this begs the main question to me also uh, about um, you know how one can destigmatize better uh, the usage of buffers because that seems to be a, a key driver for some you know why why some of that um, liquidity supply just wasn't coming in. You know, because the banks didn't want to basically use their buffers because they, they might face some questions from the supervisors. So maybe, uh, Quentin, you have some thoughts on that. Thank you, Andreas. I, I, I do. So let me just take, take on the first question on SLR. I was on the chat first. So I really think about SLR and the CLR regulation, the central day liquidity stress test I'm, I'm talking about in the paper has been somewhat complementary in generating the result. And this, that's, that's what we have in the, in the newer version of the paper. Actually, so the, the way I'm thinking about it is that what SLR is really doing is pushing these small arbitrage trades or this liquidity transformation, uh, not only outside of the banking sector, but also outside of the dealer sector into the uh, hedge fund relative value sector on these, these in, and these uh, similar institutions. So, um, and, then the, and then you also, on the other side, also limits the capacity from dealers to reabsorb the flows when the things gets in reverse. So that's the way I'm thinking about SLR, and this definitely interacts with the arbitrage constraint that the banks actually have to uh, to, to lend in repo market, which is what, what I was talking about. Um, regarding uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the question on the distribution, so I think it definitely plays a role, but I also believe we have to be somewhat careful because the distribution of reserve in the system should be, should be endogenous. And so the fact that we observe that there is a certain amount of reserves that's used by dealers and that seems to be uh, an, an important metric to monitor, which is what Daryl Duffy is showing, um, could be also somewhat endogenous to the to the need of the system, the cost of the system on, on, on the other side. So it could be important to the extent that these things are kind of unexpected. And so you need to move the money like twice, first to the dealer sector, and then after that it can be moved to the repo market. But otherwise, I would think with this distribution being uh, endogenous. And then on, on LCR, uh, I think you'll put, but, so that's also my, my conclusion, my, my take on it. I don't think LCR was really binding. And, and you're right, maybe something that I didn't highlight uh, enough is that the presentation, the model I present is very US centric in the sense that the actual interpretation or implementation of this intraday liquidity stress test through CLR, which seems to be 
on the stricter side is really uh, a US uh, interpretation. And it's a little bit unclear if this uh, generalized to more jurisdiction that I don't know. Okay, very good. Um, well, thank you for that, uh, Quentin. I mean, I don't see any more um, questions in the chat, so I think we can, we can, um, um, there is one quick one um, from our colleague, the FAMA. I don't know, Linda, if you're able, if you're able to read it. I, I, I'm not able to read it, but uh, j just a very quick answer on, uh, so variation margins are basically directly linked, for instance, to volatility in the market. Uh, certainly um, the coincidence of this few days in which several central banks intervened and the volatility, let's say, looking at VIX just simply went down is, uh, I think, quite undis undisputable. So I am not saying that this is exactly the pandemic emergency purchase program of the ECB, but it's all the interventions that were done by the central banks and they could have had different effects, but they simply um, had an effect on the volatility or I have not seen any other factor that you could have uh, attributed to, to that uh, on in these very few, few days when the market turned or calmed down. Okay, uh, great. <clears throat> Thanks a lot, uh, Linda. So that I think that was not a question. It wasn't a question. I mean, it was a comment, and I think we can share it um, with you afterwards. There was some feedback on your presentation, and then um, I think also we've got another um, comment as well from Sean Collins, who was giving us a link um, to a symposium on re re repo market volatility regulations. Um, but I think, I mean, all that is left for me to do now is to thank um, our three excellent speakers. Uh, Linda, Carolyn, and Quinton, and our also excellent uh, discussants, Alba, Dunhong, and Marson. I mean, I must say, I learned a lot uh, from the session. I think there's plenty of food for thought um, for, for working further um, on these issues in, in the FSB circles. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, for, for the contributions today and also for the, for the colleagues who, who raised questions and, and made comments um, during this discussion. One last thing uh, before closing, um, I've been asked to remind uh, those of you who are intending to join the second day of the conference uh, tomorrow, uh, the start time uh, will be at 1.30 p.m. Basel time. So thank you very much and um, goodbye.